Hello and welcome to the symposium Post-Pandemic Care Strikes, Centering Migration and Critical Race Perspectives. On behalf of uh, Simon Black and myself, I'd like to wish you a really warm welcome. Uh, I'm Maud Perrier and I'm going to start by introducing the symposium and introducing our roundtable speakers. The pandemic has exacerbated the crisis of care, but also laid bare how the crisis impacts women differentially depending on social location. So how can we seize this moment of heightened public consciousness about the gendered, class and racialized divisions of reproductive work? We think the voices of domestic and care workers who assert the value of their work, demand recognition and better pay need to be at the heart of this discussion. So we're very excited to welcome activists to this round table who have organized care strikes, mutual aid, legal reform and led worker and community organizations across the United States, Latin America, Canada and the UK. This symposium is one of the first transnational cross-sectoral conversations about care strike. In contrast to many events on International Women's Day that focus on celebrating women's individual success in the workplace, this is an opportunity for us to look both backwards to the history of low paid women's strikes and forward to the possibilities and challenges of what the new post pandemic order will bring to these struggles. So in that regard, we're very thrilled that historian Pramila Nadison from Barnard College Columbia is joining us to talk about organizing social reproduction and the politics of race after the round table. Too often, domestic workers and migrant care workers are sidelined from discussions of labor movements. We hope to redress this by deploying a differentiated analysis of capitalism's devaluation of reproductive labor that doesn't pit some women's pandemic exhaustion against each other. So we think that bringing social reproduction and critical race theories together is important for bringing forth a new wave of future care strikes in a post pandemic world. In our Simon and I in our respective research on care workers labor movements in the USA, Canada and Australia have witnessed that solidarity between parents, wage carers and communities can successfully act as a strategic wedge in labor relations, which neoliberal managers underestimate at their peril and enable workers to gain resources and better conditions from local governments and private employers. But for migrant and some domestic care workers, the question of alliances with care receivers who are often exploitative employers is much more difficult and requires consideration for building cross sectoral coalitions. So we're delighted to bring together activists and academics in the same room today to consider the question of the future of care strikes in a post pandemic world. And we look forward to rich discussions about the theories and praxis of care strikes and worker organizing. I'd like to also uh, start by uh, a few thank yous before I introduce our roundtable speakers. I'd like to thank uh, Veronica Deutsch, uh, Lindsay Adoranti, Phil Nadangeli for their uh, behind the scenes support, and also the Sociological Review Foundation for funding this event. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our four round table speakers. Esther Lutz Davis, organizes with the Women's Strike Assembly in London. She's worked in a variety of childcare jobs including as a nanny and agency nursery nurse, and she's currently a teaching assistant in a secondary school. Her organizing and thinking center around both the paid and unpaid dimensions of care work and the political and industrial struggles that are necessary to build a better world. Our second uh, speaker is Adriana Paz Ramirez. She's the Regional Coordinator for Latin America for the International Domestic Workers Federation. 
Adriano is originally from Bolivia and a labor rights organizer and popular educator with experience of working in social justice, labor rights with low wage migrant workers for grassroots organizations, trade unions and NGOs. Her expertise is to support movement building and grassroots power by translated workers' frustrations, needs and ideas into actions, tools and strategy to support and strengthen their vision and political action. Our third speaker is Monique Tu Nguyen. She's a passionate change maker on the leading edge of social justice. Since becoming the executive director of the Matahari Women Workers Center in 2012 in Boston, Matahari has become a vibrant community organization advancing the rights and protections of domestic workers, immigrants, and their families. Monique spearheaded the successful passage of the Massachusetts Domestic Workers Bill of Rights in 2014. Her writings appeared in the Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, and she recently received the 2021 Immigrant Hero Award for her leadership in creating the Mass Undocu Fund, a 1 million COVID-19 cash relief fund for undocumented migrant workers. Monique's drive for social justice is rooted in her experience as a former undocumented immigrant and daughter of Vietnam War refugees. And our final speaker is Stéphanie Vachon. Stéphanie is a representative du secteur des CPE à la Fédération de la Santé et Services Sociaux. And she graduated in early childhood education in Sherbrooke in 2000. She's been a childhood educator for 21 years and a union activist since 2010. She was a member of the regional executive of the Syndicat des Travailleuses de l'Estrie CSN, where she held the position of president for eight years. She's also a union trainer for her peers since January 2016, and she's part of the political leadership of the Fédération de la Santé et des Services Sociaux as a representative for the CPA sector, which is composed of all the unions, uh, the early childhood unions across the province of Quebec. So she represents 11,000 worker, unionized workers. She negotiates the national clauses directly with the Ministry, Employers Association, and the Treasury Board. And I would also like to welcome my um, colleague, uh, friend, and uh, co-organizer, Dr. Simon Black, who's an Associate Professor of Labor Studies at Brock University and the author of Social Reproduction in the City, Welfare Reform, Child Care and Resistance in Neoliberal New York. So without further ado, um, hi Simon, I, would, I will um, hand over to our first speaker, um, Esther, unless you want to say anything, Simon? No, you've covered it all, Maude. Looking forward to hearing from Esther. Great. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I apologize if I'm a little bit croaky. My voice is still recovering from Tuesday's women's strike, um, but we'll get there. Um, I'm going to start by speaking in pretty broad terms about the Women's Strike Assembly and the organizing and thinking we've been doing together for the past five years. Of course, care strikes are central to this but they're included in a broader political project. So bear with me a bit, I, I will get there. Um, and then I'll turn to some more specific questions on care strikes and building alliances across the care sector and the world. On building a movement that's capable, not only of fighting, but of winning. I don't pretend to have the answers, but I know we're only gonna be able to chart our way to the red feminist horizon together. So I'm going to start this by reading a section of a collective document we wrote in the Women's Strike Assembly in 2018 and have updated at various points since, although we need to do that again. Um, I'm doing this to bring voices that aren't mine alone into this room and to demonstrate a commitment to the collective organising we've done. So, the Women's Strike in Britain began with women coming together to explore our visions of the Red Feminist Horizon, what it could look like, and how, crucially, we could get there. 
The argument that we want to make is that the women's strike is not a one-day event set to coincide with International Women's Day each year. It's not an activist campaign or a women's project. In Europe and across the world, we're witnessing the emergence of an international movement that's experimenting with and struggling for a feminist future. In the last few years, we've fought back and we have won. Let's just take a moment to acknowledge that we've won abortion rights in Ireland. We fought tooth and nail across the Americas, from US Supreme Court nominations to sexual abusers. We've won abortion rights in Argentina and just a couple of weeks ago, Colombia as well. And we fought fascist candidates and movements in Brazil. We're not the first generation, nor will we be the last, to know that women's liberation must be central to all social movements. We're not asking for our fair share under capitalism, and we have zero desire for an equality that promises nothing more than being equally exploited. Instead, we're seeking to destroy altogether the system that by its very design divides, harms and exploits us. We already know women's liberation to be at the heart of the struggle. But just so we're clear, there will be no revolution until women's lives and our labour are central to every political question. Each time we strike, each time we assemble, each time we take to the streets, we confront the reactionary and patriarchal ideas of what it means to be a woman today. Like that we're all still considered naturally caring, that we all want to be mothers, especially good mothers, and that most of the time we're asking for it and the rest of the time we're in need of protection. Our struggles demand the revaluation of care work and emotional labour. Sounds complicated, but really just boils down to more people who are not working class women getting involved in the immense amount of work that keeps everyone alive every single day. What it doesn't mean is hiring a cleaner so your wife or girlfriend finally stops complaining. We urgently need to respect and work alongside young people in creating a future in which they're listened to as people and one that wouldn't dream of putting kids in solitary confinement at state schools or concentration camps in the desert. We need urgent support for people who care for children and we desperately need a plan to care for and offer dignified lives to the older members of our communities. In, if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that as a matter of local, national and international urgency, we must combat the structural and systemic forms of violence and exploitation that harm so many women. We're no longer interested in the faux debates of whether sex work is real work, if the women's strikes are real strike, um, if, whether the millions of hours we spend caring and cleaning produces real value, or if trans women are real women. Attempts to undermine the strength of this movement and thump the table about authenticity say far more about those that seek to reduce women to our biological functions and confine us into victimhood than it does about the vibrant and militant tidal wave we are building. By looking to the wealth of knowledge produced by black feminism, trans feminism and sex worker rights movements, we know who our sisters are. We know that women of colour, trans women and sex workers have a central role to play in dismantling the capitalist patriarchal systems of power that oppress us all. So that's kind of the end of a perspective. It's a much longer piece, actually, but that is kind of, uh, I think, gets across some of the key points we want to say. Um, so what have we done in the past five years to try and make good on any of that? Um, so on the 8th of March itself, over five years, we have taken to the streets and we have refused reproductive labour, both paid and unpaid. Um, we've provided strike funds to enable women to do that. Um, and we've taken space in cities across the country, as well as, of course, being actually just quite a small part of a global movement being led and centred by our sisters in Latin America who can get millions of women onto the streets. And we're not there yet here. Um, but we, we have use support from our male comrades providing food and childcare to help enable that labour to be the job. In withdrawing that labour we make our work visible and in London alone we've organised four major mass mobilisations including one two nights ago that brought together a vibrant coalition of groups and in particular centering sex workers, our Kurdish sisters and our Latin American sisters who all organise at the heart of our assemblies and from whose movements we have learnt so much. We've shut down Soho year after year. In 2020, we shut down Oxford Street for two hours with a mass clothes swap. We've confronted capital outside the Bank of England. We've organised stay and plays across London, attended by hundreds of parents, enabling them to participate in thinking through how we could organise the work of care differently. We've occupied government departments with our trans siblings and last year organised public memorials to grieve those we lost 
during the pandemic. I could talk for hours about each 8th of March and what it means and what led us to our actions. I could share our beautiful call out for this year's with the simple demand, we want to live. But instead, I want to turn to what we've done between the, the days each year to make good on our promise that the women's strike is more than a day. So, so we've organised feminist and fascist assemblies, we've confronted and confronted the far right in central London and won. We've organised reading groups and consciousness raising sessions um, around care and we've organised around the coming ecological price collapse. And we've done more. But for the purpose of this event, I want to turn to looking at the union branches we've built and the political industrial strategies we're developing. Now, people always love it when you talk about sex work and childcare in one breath, but uh, bear with me. I actually think it's important to think strategically and we can learn a lot from the sex worker organising in terms of how we organise care. Because um, the fact of the matter is we envision quite similar strategies. Since 2018, sex workers have been unionising with a grassroots union, United Voices of the World. Alongside this, they've built up the Decrim Now campaign that demands the full decriminalisation of sex work. The reasoning for this is that decrim without a union is hyper exploitation, but a union without decrim only has limited power in certain areas of the sector. Um, now, let's look at childcare and what we can learn from that. The strategies we need to build there are not yet so developed, so we need to think them through. We've built another union branch with the same union um, of nursery workers, predominantly in privatised nurseries, which is the vast majority of the sector in the UK now. Um, and they were able to get some important wins early on in the pandemic as nurseries stayed open while schools closed, jeopardising the lives of those working in them. And we helped enable groups of workers walk out from their jobs on um, health and safety grounds. Um, and alongside this union branch, which is growing in strength, we have the beginnings of thinking through the political question of childcare um, with groups like My Mum's on Strike, who organised the stay in plays um, during Women's Strike and some of our comrades looking towards building cooperative childcare centres. And the reason we need a dual political industrial strategy in childcare is that unionisation without any political demands around things like free universal childcare and similar means skyrocketing prices force working class women to take on yet more unpaid care work. Whereas meanwhile, any demand for universal free childcare without a union means the hyper exploitation of those doing the paid work in the sector. In essence, across the care sector, the fight's common. It's that our labour be valued, whether paid or unpaid, and we must fight together to reach that point. Um, so I was asked specifically to talk about the possibility of alliances between the informal and formal sector and of cross-sectoral and international care strikes. I first want to emphasise that conditions are obviously not the same across the sector, domestically or globally. That those in the global south, migrants, women and women of colour, are frequently working in more precarious positions and do even more unpaid reproductive work than the rest of us. Strategies clearly need to be specific and come from the workers, and here I'm including those doing unpaid reproductive work as well themselves. But there's a common thread of the devaluing of care work that binds us and means our liberation is bound together. Now this work won't be easy, coalition building never is. In the Women's Strike Assembly we've built and worked in several coalitions from feminist anti-fascism to the current fight to kill the incredibly authoritarian policing and crime bill which is passing through our parliament. Uh, coalition, these coalitions have never been straightforward. By their nature coalitions hold a range of people, groups and views with different interests and people don't always agree or even get on, but we need the patience to do it. In her book, The Right to Sex, Amaya Srinivasan quotes the US feminist activist Bernice Johnson Reagan saying that coalition work is not done in your home. Coalition work has to be done in the streets and you shouldn't look for comfort. Some people will want to come to a coalition and they rate the success of the coalition on whether or not they feel good when they get there. They're not looking for a coalition, they're looking for a home. And this me speaks to several things actually, one being that people need homes and organisations that they can build and that really clearly represent their own interests. And I think that's what we're trying to 
to do with the union branch at United Childcare Workers. And I know Veronica, who's in this call with the Nanny Solidarity Network, is doing similar um, amazing work with nannies. And I think those things are really important. Um, but we also need coalitions where we come together across our differences. Um, and in some ways, I don't particularly want to think about what's possible in terms of uh, that organising. What I want to think about is what is necessary. Because if we believe something to be necessary to build the kind of caring world we want to see, then we have to do it ourselves. And it has to be possible. Uh, now I'm going to return quickly to when I was on the streets two nights ago. I was walking backwards in front of the front banner of the demo, uh, mainly trying to keep us on route and make sure no one got hit by any cars. Um, and the front banner just said, we want to live, and it was entirely unbranded. Um, and I was struck by the mix of people holding it. Um, there was a group of older Kurdish women alongside some young sex workers and mixed in with others, but they were together chanting in unison, first Jinjian Azadi, which is a rallying cry of the Kurdish freedom movement, meaning women life freedom, uh, and then no bad whores, just bad laws. And there was this real moment where I realised that this is what we've been working towards building uh, in our union branches and our political organising, because that image was not possible five years ago. It's consistent organising across these communities with these women as central parts of our assemblies, taking seriously the work they do and what we can learn from each other. Um, that made that possible and it means we, they and we now see the connections of these struggles and stand in solidarity with one another and this gives me so much hope for literally building any other alliance. Um, I think there's the question of formal and informal care workers and the demands are obviously different and union organising is harder amongst the informal sector for, for groups like nannies and again I want to give another shout out to the Nanny Solidarity Network for doing that really hard work but union organising isn't easy anywhere especially in sectors like the care sector, which are, in this country at least, traditionally have very low unionisation. Um, they're privatised and they're not those old industrial jobs. Um, so, but again, what I've, many individuals like myself have worked across several areas of the care sector and seen the common problems, the instability, the low pay and just the lack of care or value for the work we're doing. Um, I think it's interesting when we think about how to overcome barriers and again I'm going to make the comparison with some of the work we've done with sex workers um, because there we've seen there's clearly a big divide between criminalised full service sex workers and strippers who have a workplace and colleagues but in seeing their common problems, their common fight, they've all seen victories. Um, but going turning back to childcare, I want to throw into the mix when we think about informal versus formal workers, those who do unpaid care work. Parents, grandparents, predominantly women, in particular working class women and women of colour who cannot afford extortionate childcare fees to pay someone else to care for their kids. And what's very clear to me is that the current system of care isn't working for anyone. In the UK in 2016, 20% of nursery workers didn't get a living wage. Nannies pretty routinely work without sick pay or holiday pay and 41% of parents have childcare costs similar to their rent. This is not sustainable and we can and need to fight it together. Our movement clearly has to be international too, not simply because we have so much to learn from other movements which are so far ahead of us here, but because our need for care is international and in a globalised world lots of those working the lower paid care jobs are migrants. I think we can take the already global strikes on March the 8th as a starting point to build a global movement. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with the call of Feministas Transfronterizas or the Cross-Border Feminist Assembly, who wrote in their manifesto in 2021, from our diverse feminisms intertwined and empowered by our cross-border connection, we call the global feminist strike. With our strike, we want to connect the struggles and rebellions that we're building together. And that is what I believe we can and must do through our unions and in the streets. Thank you. Well, thank you, Esther, for this uh, moving and incisive uh, address. Um, 
Our next speaker is uh, Adriana Paz Ramirez. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, I'm also going to turn off my camera because my internet connection is not very well and um, I usually like to engage. I want you to see me, but now I really want to make sure that uh, you can hear me well. So I'll start um, sharing my screen. Okay, I think you can see it now, right? I can't see you, uh, so <laughs> I'm going to... Yes, we You can. want to let me know? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so first I wanted to send uh, greetings to uh, Monique Le Guyen because she is um, part of Matahari Center. It's affiliated to the National Domestic Works Alliance in the United States who are our affiliates in the US. So she uh, and the Matahari Center are part of our big global family in the International Domestic Workers Federation. So greetings sisters from Mexico. So um, the title of this presentation, it's we are not part of your family. Domestic workers and international struggle for labor rights and recognition. We are not part of your family. This is uh, one of the first articulation of rights that domestic workers started to um, come up with in, in Latin America um, during their um, first articulation of rights. So, uh, but I think it still describes very well the type of uh, recognition and the positioning that they are workers and not part of the family. Usually this work has been uh, considered as not proper work and they are not considered as workers, but rather as helpers or as part of the family, which resembles very much to um, colonial and relationships. So this picture is uh, our uh, latest Congress in Cape Town in 2018. So this shows a little bit the diversity and how big it's the movement. Um, very quickly, my presentation outline, I'm going to uh, try to do it quickly, but basically this presentation has two parts. First, the uh, global domestic workers movement, um, starting with IDWF, which is my institutional house, and a snapshot of domestic workers globally, some characteristics of paid care work in Latin America, or rather in the global south, and some snapshot of domestic workers in Latin America, as well as uh, the main challenges that we face today. And we're going to try to go a little bit into the history of grassroots organizing because history really informs the, why it's the, where we are today, basically, and some of the transnational organizing that made possible the passing of the C1A9, the ILO Convention on Decent Work for Domestic Workers. So the IDWF, uh, the International Domestic Workers Federation, it's the first um, global federation founded and led by grassroots domestic workers in the global south. In 2013, the network went from an international network to be a global federation. Today represents about 600,000 domestic workers individually organized into 82 unions in 64 countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and the Middle East and North Africa. We have lots of goals. The main goal is to build a strong, democratic, and united domestic workers global organization to protect and to advance domestic workers' rights everywhere. These two pictures I chose because it shows a little bit the, my location and my role in the movement. The first colorful picture shows the Latin American delegation during our Congress when they were presenting the main goal, the, the main um, victories in the last 10 years, mainly showing the 18 ratifications of C1A9 in our region. The second picture is me holding hands with our 
President Myrtle Whitboy from South Africa during the Congress. We were passing important resolutions and having elections, so it was a very joyful uh, moment. A little bit of um, care work and domestic work. First of all, domestic workers, they frame care work as a condition for life, reproduction, sustenance, and survival. Um, essential, as I said, it, it is a work that is essential for, for the sustenance of life, for social reproduction, but also for economic development, something that is usually underlooked. Care work can be, as you know, as my, as my fellow from, from the UK was saying, care work can be paid or unpaid. Unpaid when it's for your family, unpaid when it's for other families. This usually implies some tasks that involves close relationships with other persons, but also can be done without developing close relationships with other persons due to the uh, intimate nature of this work. Some of the dynamics of uh, differences of dynamics between the global and the um, uh, north and south. Whereas in the global north, paid care work and domestic work are usually compartmentalized and separated. For example, you have cleaners, nannies, nurses, home care providers, and you can hire them uh, basically to do some of these specific jobs usually. However, in the global south, domestic workers are the ones that provide and perform all types of direct and indirect care and domestic work. So they basically do everything at once. They clean, they cook, they take care of babies, kids, elderly, and members of the family with visible or invisible disabilities all at once. So they are the main providers of care. Usually um, this type of job is unrecognized and undervalued. Patriarchy and the rise of capitalism are responsible for the lack of recognition of domestic work historically has been regarded as not proper work, even for trade union leaders. Um, it's, a, it's been considered as a natural responsibility of women because we naturally care and we naturally love doing this work. Therefore, it's socially and economically undervalued and uh, unvalued and this gets manifested in employment conditions, in employment relations and wages of domestic workers. Usually the work, domestic work and care work is inconspicuous. It's importance uh, and necessity. It's only perceived when it's not performed or is poorly performed. It's undervalued. It's considered easy by people who do not do this work. It's stigmatized the resulting products or, or services do not last as they are consumed by household members. Lower wages, lower social prestige, not recognized as a profession, and the process of acquiring competencies and skills is not valued. The working conditions are inferior to other occupations, non-existing or less social protection coverage and less bargaining power. So this is the conditions of work of domestic work, at least in Latin America in the Global South. A very quick snapshot of domestic workers globally. So globally, there are 75, 6 million domestic workers. In Latin America and the Caribbean, there are 40.8 million domestic workers. This means that it's almost 20% of domestic workers population globally. And it's the second biggest population of domestic workers after Asia Pacific. So for us in Latin America, this is a significant part of the um, economically active uh, female uh, workers. Uh, taking a closer look to Latin America and the Caribbean, as I said, there are 14.8 million domestic workers, 91% are, are women, with a high presence of indigenous workers in countries and in Andean countries uh, with big indigenous populations such as Bolivia, Guatemala and Peru and big uh, presence of Afro-descendant workers in countries uh, like Brazil, Colombia, Dominican Republic. 70% are international migrants. 14.3 of them uh, of the economically active female population works in this sector. Wages are equal two or less than 50% of the average income of workers in other sectors, 
despite the adoption of laws that guarantee the national minimum wage in most countries. And 72.3 are informally employed, meaning no access to labor rights and social protection. Below, we have some pictures of our leaders, uh, domestic workers, general secretaries in the unions in Mexico and Colombia, in uh, Costa Rica and Chile, in a campaign demanding a specific types of rights. Um, some of the main challenges of Latin America, because like regionally the movement is in, in of course, in different um, points, but mainly in Latin America, uh, we will see in the next slide that we have um, legal um, legal um, protection, uh, structures of legal uh, protection. However, the informality is the main challenge. According to the ILO, there are three main sources of informality. The first one is when you are completely excluded from the labor laws or from the legal protections. The second type is um, you can be included in the uh, legal protections, but the protection is not an adequate level of protection. And the third one is it's not a matter of being excluded or an inadequate type of protection, but rather implementation gaps. Uh, meaning that there are no regulations and there is no reinforcement and non monitoring of the laws or the regulations. And when a law or regulation doesn't have uh, monitoring and, um, and uh, fiscalization, that means that that law is um, condemned or bound to not be implemented. So in theory, I want to make these two columns. What's, what, what do we have in theory, what the movement has achieved and what is in practice. So in theory, all domestic workers in Latin America and Caribbean are covered by national labor legislation. Uh, I won't go into details, but um, mostly domestic workers are covered under the legal, uh, sorry, the federal or national labor legislation or covered through secondary laws or subordinated regulation or specific laws, meaning that there are many countries that have specifically domestic workers laws. This means that domestic workers are not explicitly excluded from labor laws. However, this does not mean that domestic workers enjoy equal treatment with domestic, uh, with, in, in comparing with other workers in general. This also doesn't mean that the level of coverage is adequate. In practice, we have 70.3 of domestic workers that are informally employed. Out of these 70.3, it's because 67, it's because of lack of implementation and 5% due to legal gaps, meaning that the laws are not uh, adequate for them. So why is this? I mean, we have laws, we have regulatory frameworks, but in practice, domestic workers' lives have not changed much. This is because patriarchy and racism and colonial practices and capitalism get manifested in practice for domestic workers. So, but why and how domestic workers in Latin America in theory are covered um, by legal legislation? Um, if you see Asia and Africa and MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, it's a very different picture. There are not so much regulations. So for this, we have to go and see the domestic workers organizing in Latin America. And I will go very quickly, but I want to start with a quote by our vice president from Argentina. She said, we were born because and despite of many no's, we are used to hear no all the time. No from our employers, no from our governments, from our husbands, from male trade unionists, from everyone. No, you can't organize. No, you don't qualify. No, you don't know about politics. No, you don't have time. But we proved them wrong. So the history of domestic workers organizing in Latin America goes back to 1930s from clandestine unions and associations to then create a regional confederation of domestic workers in the Caribbean and Latin America in the 80s being this the first one uh, confederation uh, regionally, to then join to an international federation in, the, in, in 2013. So his history matters and empowers. Um, here I just picked two countries that I, uh, I am more familiar with. 
And very quickly, I want to share the history of domestic workers so you can see that feminism in Latin America, it's very intersectional. Even in the 1930s, where race, class, and gender and ethnicity are all intertwined in order to claim and reclaim rights. So the first union in Bolivia was in 1935. Uh, we was called at that time Culinary Women's Union, headed by Petronila Infanti, who was an anarcho-syndicalist indigenous woman and one of the forerunners of the organized feminist uh, in, in Bolivia. At that time, their um, demands were free expression of ideas and the press, that the culinary art be recognized as a profession. This is a demand that up until today, domestic workers are still claiming uh, eight hours working day and Sunday rest. The replacement of the word domestic with the word domestic worker. In Spanish, domestic um, has the connotation to um, be a domestic a domesticated animal so that's why they fought a lot to take out the domestic from 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 the, this title in brazil the first union was in 1936 a first association founded by laudelina de campos melo a black domestic worker and a militant of the clandestine black communist party of brazil fighting against racial oppression ending slavery like conditions and recognition of workers rights their uh, rights, articulation of rights were changing over time. In the 60s was inclusion into the labor laws. In the 70s was minimum wage, 10 hours of work with breaks, compensation for night shifts and inclusion into the labor code. In the 80s, in the 80s they were fighting for democracy and joined, and they joined to the foundation of what we know today, the Workers' Party in Brazil. Um, I don't think I have time to go through this, but th this chart is basically um, a comparative chart between domestic workers union that are more like a social type, social movement type of unions and the difference between regular trade unions. Um, but um, basically um, domestic workers unions are run by domestic workers unions that are volunteers in many cases are retired domestic workers regular union by permanent paid staff uh, representatives and um, and support staff um, i will pause a little bit to see if you can read but um, i will just skip this Basically, um, domestic workers unions have um, not, they are not trade unionists in the typical sense, but rather a community unionism or social movement type of union, and this is how they, they run. Um, I will, I think I don't have time to go into the genealogy of the rights discourse. But basically, I'm going to only read the premises. Domestic workers started articulating since 1930s and throughout the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s uh, with some very basic premises that made possible the passing and the adoption of an international law such as C-189. First, domestic work is work because it's being regarded usually as not proper work. Um, here I prepare how this shifts power at the level of discourse, how this shifts power at the level of practice, and what it means in terms of labor legislation. But I won't go into that because I know we have another wonderful speakers. The second premise was we are not part of your family. We have our own family. Basically, this means regulating employment relations and working conditions to the level of the household. This, the third one is our work makes all other work possible. Um, throughout time, domestic workers have developed a very strong analysis of the value of their labor, and they basically refuse the idea that domestic work is a non-productive work and position this work as a fundamental to other forms of work. The fourth one is we want what you have. Basically, 
here what they want is to have in practice the same type of protections and benefits. Uh, the latest manifestation in labor legislation of this premise was during the pandemic. For example, in Peru, in the midst of the pandemic, they were able to win mandatory written contracts. Having a contract and a mandatory written contract, it means a strategy to overcome informality and means to have um, employment conditions that both employer and employer can abide and respect. Uh, also, in Mexico, they want the right to have access to uh, social protection coverage, being uh, making a mandatory law, not a voluntary law that the employers can contribute whether they want it or not. And in Chile, also in the pandemic, they won the right to have unemployment insurance because all the other workers were having some type of government uh, support. Uh, for the ones who lost their work in the pandemic, uh, but domestic workers were excluded from unemployment insurance and they achieved this in 2021. Very quickly, how domestic workers made the unthinkable possible. So first, I think the strong commitment to the self-political representation. We don't want professionals speaking for us. Uh, even though they were very, very skillful in uh, building a very like big type of network of alliances, they were always very, were very careful and are very careful to avoid the risk of being constructed as victims and recipients of goodwill as a consequence of the support received by organizations that are not composed by domestic workers. The second one is their organizing model. Basically, we can see three types of organizing models in Latin America. First uh, being one, the union model that um, takes the class identity, but brings and recognizes the importance of gender and care work into the traditional trade unionism that usually it's male dominated. The second model is the association model that mobilizes around transnationalism of race and gender and pursues new politics of identity around migrancy. We can see this in Central American unions where the, the, the migration corridors are, are very old and very prevalent. And also community unionism that it's embedded in social movements struggles. We can see that in the cases of Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, where domestic workers, of course, because of their identity, are also part of the indigenous movements, of the black movements, etc. Strategic alliances, they created class-based uh, alliances with other trade um, unions and with the labor movement through the union women's committed. Also, they created gender-based alliances, uh, meaning with feminist NGOs, organizations from left to uh, feminist organizations to Catholic organizations, also around race and ethnicity-based alliances with academics and intellectuals, and occasionally with left movement, movements and workers' party, like in the case of Bolivia, with the mass, the movement towards socialism, or in Brazil with the workers' party. And also another component is the transnational nature of their building, uh, of their movement building and organizing. Examples of this, it's the Regional Domestic Workers Confederation in Latin America, the CONALTRAO, and of course the Global, the International Domestic Workers Federation. So um, all these strategies and, and grassroots building has made possible the passing of C-189. Here there is a very quick uh, uh, genealogy of how this was possible. The, in 2005, uh, we can see the first attempts of uh, done in Latin America by the Conal Trout to try to push for an international legislation that at that time it didn't have too much traction, but they were envisioning uh, international law to protect domestic workers. But it was not until 2006 that the movement galvanized into a global movement with the support of many different organizations and feminist groups and intellectuals such, such as the Global Labor Institute, WIGO and the ILO. 
in 2010, in 2011, they made powerful alliances, transnational organizing and international solidarity. Um, and like the, our president says, we were able to shake the foundations of the ILO because it was indeed the first time that the actual workers occupied physically the space of the ILO. The impacts of the ILO in the region in Latin America has resulted in the creation or in the uh, official recognition of 15 new domestic workers union. Uh, 18 Latin American countries have ratified at the ILO convention. Of course, this is not because our countries were very progressive and very aware, but because of the power of mobilization and advocacy of the domestic workers in the region. We can see 40 labor reforms, policy innovation and new legislations. And like the ILO representative in Mexico said the other day, it made C1A night, it made the ILO known in every home. Before that, not many people knew the role or the existence of the ILO. Here, there are some flyers of the passing of new laws and domestic workers debating in the TV. Today, um, we know that winning policies and winning labor legislation is not enough. After 10 years of, of the passing of C1A9, still the conditions have not changed. And during the pandemic, we have seen the union agendas and the main priorities going to steps backwards. So today, the agenda, the consented regional agenda to fight back the conditions of informality are basically improving wages, employment conditions, mandatory written contracts, effective social protection, house inspections, skills training and professionalization, and sectoral or tripartite negotiation. If you remember my slide about the first unions in the 1930s, it's not much different, really. Um, of course, with uh, 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 demands that are more articulated, but basically, in essence, they are asking the same, that their work is considered and regarded in practice the same as other sectors. Um, and I think this is it. These are pictures of our regional uh, leadership school for domestic workers, where we bring 15 countries, 27 domestic workers union uh, from Latin America and the Caribbean. And um, we have a lot of fun, as you see. And we are really looking into keep sustaining the unions keep sustaining the organizing and uh, being, uh, building leadership uh, in a constant basis. So the movement can be strong and can still be fighting back for the demands and goals that they are, uh, that they said to have. Um, sorry, I think I am past my, my 20 minutes. Um, how can I, do you still stop sharing? I'm not sure if I stop sharing. Okay, now. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, for this uh, wonderfully rich presentation, looking both backwards and forwards. Um, now, uh, I'd like to invite uh, our next speaker, Monique to Nguyen, uh, to join us. Uh, Monique, we're looking forward to hearing your, your talk. Hi everyone, are people able to see my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, let me try this again. How about now? No? Not for me. Simon, can you see anything? I'm trying to do the entire window. No, yeah, try sharing entire window, Monique. Okay, I'm doing it now. Is that working? No. Hmm. 
Would you like to send me your slides and I try to share? Yeah, I can do that. I can uh, continue talking. Give me one minute. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Monique Sinwin. I am the Executive Director of Matahari Women's Workers Center in Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I'm here to represent uh, Matahari based in Boston, but also our, our um, we're a affiliate organization of the National Domestic Workers Alliance as well. Um, wait a minute. That's great, Monique. We can see your presentation now. Monique, are you able to hear me? You, you I don't know if you're not, you're still on mute. Here we go. Great. Can you hear me now? Awesome. Okay, technology. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to speak around, speak about the disruption of culture, the culture of exploitation that is uh, prominent in the United States and also the world under capitalism. But we wanted specifically to uplift the, the naming of exploitation and what it looks like in our everyday world in the United States and also across um, in our homes and across the world. So my presentation is um, called Disrupting the Culture of Exploitation, How Low-Wage Workers Are Fighting Gender Violence Through Building Power. Oftentimes we get kind of defeated with the whole notion of being able to uh, fight gender exploitation, but oftentimes we, we don't speak enough about what does power building look like, especially for people who are marginalized. So Matahari is constantly experimenting and building this practice of how do we build power for ourselves as people individually, but also as a collective, as a movement. Um, let's start with my story. Um, I came to Matahari uh, when I was at the age of 25, looking for the quote unquote movement um, because I, my family and I were um, immigrants and we, uh, we were undocumented in Houston, Texas. And that really shaped my understanding of people who are in the shadows and are and oppressed. So by the time I graduated college, I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't know where to go or what to do. So I went to out looking for what I didn't know then, what I do know now, I was looking for a political home. And the political home was so important for me to find was I needed a place where my whole self was recognized, but uh, my parts of me that wanted to be recognized, wanted to become political and become active in changing the world so that people like me and my family aren't exploited um, anymore. And um, I stumbled upon, Mat upon Matahari after doing so many um, community organization meetings and whatnot, and I didn't feel at home until I came across Matahari, where it was just a humble meeting of women workers of class um, who are women of color, and that's when I knew that there was something that I could I could plant my feet in in Matahari. And ever since then, I've been with Matahari for 13 years now. And Matahari is turning 20 years old this year. Um, Matahari is an organization that builds the power of women working in low-wage industries to end gender violence and exploitation. And Matahari is also a member of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, an affiliate organization. And I, uh, I've been, I'm proudly serving the second term as a board member uh, elected into the alliance by um, affiliation. affiliation. And, um, my background, I've then uh, worked in the gender violence movement in the United States and uh, recently finished my Roddenberry Fellowship to uh, experiment around language justice to build power. 
So I'm going to take a pause for people to also brag yourself in your story of exploitation. Um, I call it traveling into inner space. Oftentimes, we, people often glorify uh, traveling into outer space a lot, you know, with, with all the technology and Elon Musk and I, I don't know what the other guy's name from Amazon that wanna, everyone's trying to race to, the, uh, to space. But um, I think the most important space to travel to is with, within yourself because that's where your, your, the core of your essence of who you are and where your power is. Um, so I invite you in for, for these questions to travel into inner space. Ask yourself, have you ever worked and were not paid for your labor? Ask yourself, have you ever worked overtime and were not paid for that paid the overtime rate? The United States um, uh, overtime rate is after you work a full time schedule, which is 40 hours in the United States, anything after 40 hours, you have to get paid a time and a half. That means your rate plus half of that rate in addition. A lot of times people don't know that they are that they are entitled to overtime in the United States, no matter what industry you work in. And I ask you, have you ever felt taken advantage of in the workplace? So take a moment to reflect on that because these questions really help us connect as a society um, and our cultural exploitation that we may uh, subversively just subject ourselves to without even consciously recognizing. And these are the questions that we ask um, members as they come into the organization. We are a base building organization and the initial touch points that we have is that people come into our meetings um, with some sort of hope or some sense of looking for justice. And these are simple questions that really build people's um, confidence in seeing that it's not just them having this experience. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times whenever you're taken advantage of or exploited, you have a lot of shame as if you are um, your predisposition for it or that you are deserving of it. But when people recognize that they are sh they're sharing a shared experience that, that is problematic, um, it's a moment to pivot into building power. This is a question that we ask thousands of times uh, every year to workers that come through our doors. Um, and you might notice a lot of our, my slides are coming from uh, a lot of historical uh, pictures and artifacts that are drawn from a project that Matahari was a part of and is a part of with the National Domestic Workers Alliance about um, our, uh, finding the, the, the hidden history and domestic worker histories that are entitled to us to access. Um, so if you check out this website called bwherstories.com, you'll find a very beautiful and very deeply invested timeline that Matahari had the privilege to help launch um, in the National Domestic Workers Alliance. So who is Matahari? So I touched base a little bit about Matahari, but I would love to dig in more to even show you pictures and give you a culture, um, give you essence of our culture and the texture of who we are. We are a women of color organization that uh, builds the uh, political power of women working in industries, um, low-wage industries. And I don't say low-wage workers because the, the workers in that work in these industries are not deserving of low wages, but because of the wages, the industries themselves, they are low-wage um, and under-recognized, undervalued. But the, the people working within them are so much more valuable than what they are given in the United States. Um, so y'all, you probably wonder what is the name Matahari? Where does it come from? Um, a lot of times people think when they think about Matahari, they think about the spy. There was a spy that used her sexual prowess to infiltrate um, spaces of uh, men where they they held a lot of power, made a lot of decisions, and also had shady backroom deals. And uh, Matahari was a spy that 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 uh, posed as a belly dancer, exotic, erotic dancer, exotic dancer, and she was able to to collect. Um, confidential information and manipulated uh, uh, men who are holding power to get the information that she needed. But Matahari itself actually comes from the word the sun in the language Malay. Um, our founder Carol Gomez in 2002 founded Matahari and um, she wanted a name that was um, inconspicuous and would not be revealing um, uh, to the women that came to seek out help. Uh, originally Matahari was an organization that 
help um, survivors of violence and exploitation escape from the situation, from everything from domestic violence, sexual assault to trafficking. Uh, women came to Matahari to seek uh, help and support. And Matahari was run by um, volunteers for six years became, before it became a nonprofit organization. And over the course of six years, a group of four people who founded Matahari became a group of 60 people who worked in different agencies and nonprofit organizations that saw that women um, in the Boston area were turned away just because of their race or their lack of English uh, speaking um, fluency, and they helped them um, fight the violence in their lives. And here's a picture of us. Um, in 2000 and I believe 2019 was our last one of our last members assemblies before the pandemic. Um, in Matahari, we are a base building organization and we practice governance. That means that we practice the ability to make decisions as a collective and in, as individuals. And one of our key governance spaces is our annual members assembly, where we gather and outreach and organize our membership to come to this assembly where we present to them our work areas that we want to propose and as and the assembly um, chooses the, the campaign areas and the work areas that the organization um, wants to work on in the coming year and we also uh, recruit them into teams to execute on the campaigns and the works that they voted on and here's a picture of um, one of our key leadership development spaces in San Matahari um, we focus heavily on leadership development of, of our membership to become political leaders, to become storytellers about what their conditions and their experiences are. And uh, in our community fellows retreat, we have it annually, annually where we uh, have a boot camp of sorts of our organizing and political education. And this is one of our breakout groups that we have here. So who are domestic workers and tip workers? I mentioned that Matahari organizes women in um, low wage industries, but specifically our focus has been um, historically mostly domestic work. Um, since uh, 2009 through, the, through 2020, our focus has been around domestic workers. And one of the things we're most known for is helping pass the Massachusetts Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. In, 2014 that established basic labor protections for um, for domestic workers in our in our state, um, which covers over 100,000 domestic workers. Since then, after we passed that law, we actually faced a lot of opposition after we passed from um, from a corporation that um, from au pair agencies. Au pair agencies um, pay. Uh, a young woman uh, to come to the United States to work as au pairs and are paid a subminimum wage. Subminimum wage meaning that they get paid like under what the minimum wage is in the United States and also in the state. Um, au pairs are basically um, childcare workers and they, they are reframed as student exchange in order to exploit them. But through the fighting of uh, against the Au pair agencies, we got invested in fighting against the subminimum wage. And in 2020, we we were faced with the reality that most of the workers that came to Matahari to get uh, cash assistance or support because of COVID were one third um, domestic workers and one third tip workers. And we were we knew that we had to do something to also bring tip workers into the fold and build their power as well, because we are fighting the same battle against um, subminimum wage and the fight against evaluation of work that is so critical. Um, care in a different context, I would say. Domestic workers are care in the household, but tip workers, they are care in so many industries from restaurant industry to nail salon workers to Uber and Lyft drivers, gig economy, gig economy workers. And tip workers are basically people who are rely on tips to make a decent wage. Um, and they suffer the plight and the old um, legacy of the subminimum wage in the United States. Here's another picture. Um, one interesting thing about the picture at the top right here 
is that um, this is one of our patron saints here. Her name is Melnia Cass. And she is a really well-known local hero, a civil rights leader in Massachusetts. But she takes a she takes a particular importance in the domestic workers movement because in in the 1960s 1970s we found out that her group along uh, with the women's service club they passed the rights for domestic workers in the state of Massachusetts the right to minimum wage the right to overtime and the right to form a union and we actually didn't know that until 30 40 years later when we were building we were drafting our bill and we learned through history that they domestic workers in the 1970s already passed that right and to this day we are trying to experiment and learn about how we can actually realize um, those things that she, she, her and the women's service club fought for and here on the left is olga who is a present-day leader in matahari who is a domestic worker and a tip worker and she's part of a campaign that we have inside Matahari right now to uh, implement and hold accountable the labor laws that we have right now. And she actually filed three wage theft claims against three working places that she experienced in the last couple of years. And she won back all her wages and got uh, retribution for her exploitation from her employees, employers in three different workplaces. So I'm really proud of Olga and you'll see more about her uh, moving forward. So here's the definition of gender-based violence, just so we can be grounded in, in the, um, the narrative of what we mean gender-based violence is in um, Matari. Gender violence is, <clears throat> is violence that is directed at an individual based on their biological sex or gender identity. It includes physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, and psychological abuse, threats, coercion, and economic or educational deprivation. <clears throat> whether occurring, occurring in public or private life. And here's our definition of exploitation. Exploitation is the act of using resources or the act of treating people unfairly in order to benefit from their efforts or labor. Indicators include access, accessing working hours, hazard, hazardous work, low salary, no respect of labor laws or contract and bad working conditions or wage manipulation. And these, these are the indicators of expectation in the workplace. Here's a picture of one of the beams of, um, in, in New York, I would say, I think it was uh, the Global Women's Alliance and there was like a beautiful picture of how militant they were back then in the 70s and 60s. I wanna also, ground us in the just transition framework even though matahari in the context is, is working in our micro level in an organization we are lar part of a larger movement to transition the world from an extractive economy to re regenerative economy um, if people are interested you can look up the just transition framework online and you'll learn more about what the context that we're in right now in the extractive economy and what we're trying to move into in the gener regenerative economy in our bigger movement. You see here. The extractive economy is an economy based on the removal of wealth from communities through the depletion and de degradation of natural resources, the exploitation of human labor, and the accumulation of wealth by interests outside the community. What we're working towards is a regenerative economy, an economy based on respective responsive, reciprocal relationships of interdependence between human communities and living upon which we depend. You'll see here, take a moment to read, um, read through these from extractive economy. These are the things that we, we see now, the resource and the extraction of Digging, burning, and dumping of the environment. Work is exploitation. The purpose is to impose wealth and power of the rich. The worldview now is around consumerism and colonial mindset. And governance is military, militarization. Towards the regenerative economy is a resource generation. Work is cooperation. Our purpose is towards ecological and social well-being and a worldview to caring and sacredness. 
implies um, governance to deep democracy. <clears throat> this is a shift that we are trying to fight towards. I'm now going to speak about power. I talk about power, but oftentimes it's, it seems very elusive. And for us as a movement, knowing our sense of power and measuring it is so key for us to gauge how much that we can um, we can build to be able to beat our opponents who want exploitation and um, and our demise, right? So power is the ability to control or influence circumstances. So the more that we are able to control or influence our own circumstances, we have more power. Power over is oppressive power. This is the oppressive power that we are fighting against now when people and institutions use their power for their own gain and not for the benefit of everyone. Power with is what we're fighting for, liberatory power. When people and institutions use their power for the benefit of all. <clears throat> so these are the key power areas that we focus on. Uh, it's called the power building model. And it's something that the National Domestic Workers Alliance is experimenting with and also many organizations who are considered them themselves power building organizations focus on these uh, five forms of power. And in Matahari this year, in our 10th and 20th anniversary year, we are also going to add two more areas of power that we're building towards too that are not reflected here, is around cultural power and also um, cultural power and, and modeling power. Political power is our ability to influence laws, the way that they're applied and who is in a position to make them. And in this picture is a key day that we, we signed into law, a bill that was drafted and moved by domestic workers in our state. Um, literally the provisions in the domestic workers law that we passed in the country, and it was not, um, it was the strongest bill to this day in, in across the state because we had a very participatory process that centered the leadership of domestic workers to draft the provisions of the bill. So we believe the people who are closest to the issue are truly the experts of what needs to be changed. And um, this is a day that the bill was signed in our, in our state for the domestic workers law. And you see here also at, at the wake of the pandemic, restaurant workers went to Congress to demand their price their prioritization in getting uh, protections. Narrative power. Um, narrative power is our ability to tell our own stories and make sure that other people understand our issues from our perspective rather than from the perspective of the people who exploit us. Disruptive power is our ability to use our bodies and voices to stop unjust systems from continuing to operate. So using literally like stopping, stopping the, stopping traffic in order to get our message across our times, our things that we use to. Economic power, our ability to make sure that money is spent on the things that we think are most important. Our ability to influence markets and employment as organized workers or consumers. Our ability to sustain our own institutions without dependence or philanthropy. We see economic and political power as directly linked. Transformative power, our ability to show by example the kind of world that we want to create to transform ourselves and believe in our own value. And here's a slide, because I really believe history is so important. The blueprint for our future is hidden in our history and we can never discount it enough, especially for the emergence of our field, in our field around this, because there isn't science to back this up and we are the scientists now to experiment and prove that we can, um, that there is evidence in, in the theories around race, racism, and exploitation. I'll stop sharing now, and I'll talk about some points that I was asked to cover, particularly around um, whether alliance between, alliances between workers and formal and informal sectors are important, and my experience with it. So to build power, we really need to be have everyone involved. It's not enough that that the workers 
are fighting the battle alone or people are fighting their own pockets. You have to create critical mass. And the only way that we're able to do that is to actually build alliances and coalitions, but it has to be centered and reframed so that it can bring everybody into their fold. A lot of times the fight is always around pitting against one, one person or the other, right? So now is the moment that we have to broaden our mindsets about the bigger perspective and the bigger shape that we're trying to move into as a, as a world. And you might be noticing or heard, have heard of about in the United States, there's a big, the great resignation where a lot of people are not going to work. And to me, that sounds like a strike, but there isn't, there isn't, hasn't been politicization about it where people reframe it, right? People are just willingly not going to work um, because the conditions aren't right. Their wages aren't right. And it's not worthwhile to risk their lives or the lives of their families. Um, and I want to speak to a coalition that we're building with called Care That Works. It's a coalition in the state of Massachusetts to fight for universal child care, universal child care, but ensure, ensuring that any type of care solution that we create is not off the back of workers, of child care workers, of domestic workers, because historically that's what's been done, that any type of child care solution that met the masses was done off the back of workers. It's called Care That Works Coalition is an alliance that agrees that no matter what, our child care solutions cannot exploit anyone. And international care strikes post-pandemics is so possible if we organize effectively, right? This is an opening and in a shared experience under COVID that people are noticing that care is so important in all of our lives, that we rely on care and without care, we cannot function. But the key moment that we're in right now is how do we seize the moment to organize around the reframe of that and collectively in alignment with hold our labor if the conditions aren't right. So that is our big task at this moment. How do we organize at scale and with the, the framing that brings everyone under the fold? So this is um, the mandate that we are all working in at the, at the cusp of returning back to um, quote unquote normal, the pandemic. I'm curious and I'm excited to continue on the conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Monique, for this a wonderfully rich uh, personal political uh, account and um, those important definitions of uh, power. So uh, without further ado, um, can I invite um, Stephanie Vachon to um, join us? And Stephanie, we're really looking forward to hear about what um, childcare workers and early years educators have been up to in Quebec. Thank you very much, Maude. So, um, well, hey everybody. Uh, Hi, I'm glad to be here with you. Thanks for the invitation. My name is Stéphanie Vachon and I speak French, so please excuse me for my bad accent or my poor English sometimes. I'm going to show you my, um, I got video, uh, well, it's only pictures of all our mobilization that we did, so I'm going to start it right now. Um, does it work? Do you see it? This way. Now yes. you see it, I guess. Okay, just give me a second. I need to start it again this way. Okay, so uh, first I am an indicator in the Centre de la Petite Enfance, which means Early Childhood Centres. I am also the representative of the Early Childhood Centres Union at the Fédération de la Santé et des Services Sociaux, uh, CSN, in the province of Quebec, Canada. The network of early childhood centers in the province of Quebec is about 30,000 worker. Um, our union, CSN, in early childhood represent um, 11,000 worker who work in more than 400 centers across Quebec. There is also other unions that represent about 3,000 worker in early childhood centers. So only one third of the party is unionized in Quebec. Most of our workers are women, but there are also few men. Uh, most of uh, have uh, more than 10, day, uh, 10 years of uh, seniority, but are still young and far from retirement. 
So now I'm going to tell you about the 40 years old history of childcare unions in Quebec. Uh, around 1980, the unions began to uh, establish themselves in daycare and they claim for accessibility for all the people who need the services, like universality of childcare services, free of charge for their parents and a well-paid staff that have opportunities to get unionized. Uh, they, they claim uh, kids group composition too, and the autonomy and participation of users and staff member for the daycare's management. In the province of Quebec, we need to be graduate, uh, graduate, qualify in childhood education technology to have a job in early childhood centers. It's uh, three years of studying. But the problem of poor wage condition remains unresolved. Um, this will be the battle of the uh, 1990s. In 1993, the trade union mobilization planned for an awareness campaign by producing a shocking video that compares the type of job of an educator to that of a zookeeper who is much better paid. In 1997, uh, we saw a new policy, family policy put in place uh, by the creation of the Ministry of Family and the creation of educational early childhood centers at the cost of $5 per day for all children. This has had a great beneficial effect in allowing thousands of mothers to return to the labor market. And in 1998, the unions affiliate to the CSN, like me, ask the government, the government for the first time to meet at a central bargaining table to discuss three demands. First, the significant salary adjustment and the establishment of a single single salary scale for all the worker in early childhood centers. The creation of a committee for the establishment of a pension plan and the establishment of a sector pay equity quality, uh, committee. And in 1990, uh, 1999, the union won a long battle of over the, these, these three demands, including a 35% increases. It's huge. The network of educational child care services has grown significantly since then. It has suffered a, a lot of cuts also, according to the different governments, and the union have always continued to fight to defend the network. Which brings us to the last battle, the one of 2020, 2023 negotiation, negotiation agreement for the early childhood centers in the province of Quebec, Canada, that I made with my groups. It's a story of solidarity, determination, and an exemplary mobilization. You can see the pictures. So. We have restored the trade union movement's faith in solidarity. All Quebecers has, have followed our struggle. It was a social struggle to save the child care centers network and the place of women in the labor market. We rallied the opposition party, the non-unionized circles, the private daycare workers. We had the parents behind us and we had the media following us. It was a highly popular negotiation with the support of the population of Quebec and even further abroad in Canada. For once, we did not hear about strikers taking parents hostages. The preparation of this new round of bargaining that we made uh, was based on the balance sheet firmly endorsed by all our unions. Consultation with unions in the sector have, ha have had identify five priorities, a massive wage catch-up, pedagogical time, time to fill up the children's file, time for management in the kitchen, the return of last statutory holidays, an improvement of vacation, and finally compliance with number of kids in groups. As other sectors, the effect of the budget cuts uh, the overload, the shortage of manpower is just some of the effects that have been exacerbated, but the context has made it possible to demonstrate the importance and quality of our educational childcare services in Quebec. 
In spring 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, during the general confinement, early childhood centers were in the emergency daycare mode. We had to work without any protection. Our salary was not maintained during absence related to COVID-19, and we did not have any COVID bonus. Uh, the, govern the government gave of those uh, to the other kind of job. Adding to this all, the difficulties to ensure health and safety and the overload of work related by this context. The women workers in early childhood centers were stressed, exhausted, they were feeling unrecognized and underestimated. One year later, already tired of the pandemic and sanitary measure, we started negotiation by depositing the union's demands. The employer's side found that our notebook was imposing with big monetary cost. Mobilization starts with soft actions. We start by making videos to give information about the negotiation. It was well appreciated. On one side, a movement of non-unionized women named Valorisant Ma Profession, it means value my profession, was being set up on Facebook bringing uh, together a lot of workers all around Quebec, including many of our unionized members. They demanded better condition and better recognition of the profession of uh, educators, wanted to act and go on strike. We had to take them under wing a little to explain to them their field of possible action and our union expertise that deals with the negotiation. Also, uh, another social group was formed named Ma Place au Travail. It means my place at work. It's a group of parents that, that requested places for their kids in early childhood centers. Both groups contribute to steering up the social effervescence in favor of the profession of educators and the, the importance of childcare services. The Minister of the Family could not say it was only uh, the union's demands, it was everybody's demands. The negotiation on normative, normative uh, mean all the clauses that do not involve monetary issues, it was very slow. The childcare workers were ready to go on strike already. We held them back because we just had the normative in our hands. They were feeling lots of distress, anger, and exasperation. It took so long to receive the government's monetary offer that we finally decided to go on tour to get a 10 day strike mandate from all our unions. During summer 2021, we finally received the, deposit, the monetary deposit. The increases offered did not allow the necessary salary catch up targets. The government offered to train educator 12 person salary increase to the untrained educator nine person and to other job titles six person. With this offer, the educator would earn more than the pedagogical counselors whose role is to advise the educator, so it did not make sense for us. The government found this offer very generous and demanded the return to cut in everything that is accumulation of time and resumption of time. In short, put more, uh, more bars in the windows of early childhood centers to prevent workers from being absent and to make them work more. Uh, they are already paying the price of shortage of manpower. They are not going to accept downshift in agreement that would exhaust the worker even more. The monetary deposit was not well received by our unions. The worker wanted to go on strike by early September. We absolutely had to do at least one day of strike before the end of September. We had a tight strike day schedule. All fall, we wanted to keep a rhythm to maintain the pressure, a busy trading calendar about two, three days a week by the end of November. We were still stuck in the normative. Uh, we had lots of requests that did not pass, and we couldn't wait to settle this fight uh, on the monetary issues. Uh, we did a two-day strike in October uh, 14 and 15. On October 14, the Ministry of the Family decided to put in place an administrative measure in the early childhood centers 
the measure provided for an increase in the salary but this exact measure was the July offer that we had refused. We barely had time to react when the media was made aware of the details in the minute that followed. Um, and the interest of the member, we decided not to intervene against the measure, even if we disapproved. The government was a tactic of bypassing the bargaining table um, it, it was to discredit and destabilize the unions and demobilize the member, but it, it did not work. The next day, an historic mobilization took place. Uh, it was a large demonstration in Quebec City. It brought together 6,000 workers from all over Quebec. At the end of October, the monetary discussion finally began and the Treasury Board took the lead in the negotiation. They presented a proposal for an agreement in principle that gave priority to educators again, but nothing more for other job title. For the rest of our demand, there was nothing enough satisfying. At the beginning of November, we had a three day strike. Political opposition parties were beginning to join us on a request. A motion to that effect was adopted at the National Assembly of Quebec. Uh, on November 15, we received new salary offer, prioritizing educators for an increased salary up to 18 persons. This brings it to $30 per hour. The Treasury Board stated that it covered most of our worker, it's like 80 per 80 percent. But still, they didn't want to offer anything else to other job titles that they represent 20 percent of our uh, workers. Uh, and the government refuses other demands. At the end of November, we had four days of strike and the unions were in general assemblies to vote for an unlimited general strike. 92 persons voted in favor. One of the major issues was the salary of other job title that still offered be between 6% and 9%. But the worker were also revolted to see that there were almost nothing else than the educator's salary, such as statutory holidays, the hours to fill up the children's file, the children with special needs, the kids' group composition, the vacation, sick leave, management in the kitchen. There was also a lack for sickness insurance and pedagogical time. On December 1st, it was the first day of unlimited general strike. We negotiate every day from that point until an agreement in principle was reached. Negotiation was in slow motion. The employer sides uh, did not seem to move much. And the union sides uh, made a return on all the articles that remained to be settled. On December 3, it was the third days of unlimited general strike. We received a global offer between 6 and 12 person for other job title. The Treasury Board said that it would be uh, it would not be able to join any other demand that remained. They asked us to step back a bit, saying if there was a cleanup on our part, we couldn't negotiate. The objective was to end the unlimited general strike before the following Monday. The government paid for a full page adver advertisement in all the newspaper. It says that he offered $30 an hour to educators and that he has also offered increase to other job titles. He said that he must respect the capacity of Quebecers to pay because it's their taxes that pay for that. This publicity further enraged striking workers in several alleys. On December 5, we made a press conference. It was an historic moment that brought together the three big union centers in Quebec, it's CSM, CSQ, FTQ, the three political opposition parties, the Parti libéral, Parti québécois et Québec solidaire, the two popular social groups, like I said, Valorisons ma profession et ma place au travail. They all join in to make a statement to call on the prime minister to get involved in the conflict, to settle the negotiation and grant a fair increase for other job title. Uh, on December 6, it was the four days of a limited general strike. An offer was made from the treasury board that lasted for uh, 
48 hours. It was like a end of bargaining blitz. The new offer include almost all remaining requests, increased salary between eight and 18 person, time to fill up the children's file, letter of agreement for children with special needs, better sickness insurance, plus a bonus of 3% of the salary earned during the first year of COVID to recognize the value of the worker in early childhood centers. On December 8, 2021, after six days of unlimited general strike and after an intensive negotiation under pressure, we finally had an agreement in principle at two o'clock in the morning after 44 days of negotiation. The, new, the union voted up to 93% in favor. It was the end of the national conflict and the early childhood centers reopened. We can totally say that without all of those 18 days of strike and this huge solidarity movement, we, uh, it would not have been possible to get the same result. The parents were with us, every worker, every educator, even the, um, the people in the kitchen, everybody was working together to, to make it move and to be a success. So that's it. Thank you. I'm going to stop the pictures and I'm going to try to see your face again. So I'm not by myself, I'm not talking alone. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an inspiring story of uh, perseverance and um, uh, just really, really uh, clever tactics on uh, the part of the three different unions. Thank you for sharing it with us. And we look forward to um, the question sessions where I'm sure there'll be lots more questions for all of our four speakers. So for now, I, can I um, invite us all to have a break uh, until uh, four o'clock, a little later than advertised, um, if that's okay with you, Simon? Yeah, that's fine by me. So four o'clock your time, Maud would be 11 o'clock for those who are on Eastern Standard Time. So if you're yes. thinking, oh, Maud wants to have a short break and that's five hours. No, <laughs> 11 o'clock Eastern Time. We can read. Great. Thank you. See you all back then. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. After this short break, um, Simon and I will share some brief thoughts and then um, we will be opening it up for the audience to ask um, our um, panel some questions. Um, I think Adriana has had to leave. Uh, um, Esther and Stephanie are still here. Stephanie and Esther, can you give, hi. Yeah, still here. Hi. Okay, over to you, Simon. Well, thank you, Stephanie, uh, Monique, Adriana, and Esther for those wonderful presentations, which I thought were uh, equal parts challenging in terms of, of how we think uh, with and about care workers of various social locations, various conceptualizations of care worker power, various ways of thinking about how power translates into organizing and collective action uh, against the systemic uh, devaluing of women's care work. And inspiring as well in terms of real world, world examples of organizing and collective action in, um, in such dark times. And we, need, we need that inspiration. So thank you for those presentations. Uh, I just want to end my comments to return to the question of, of strikes, care worker strikes and, and social reproduction strikes more broadly. I mean, I think we can think about strikes in terms of a few questions. I think there's the question of legality which came up in the in the presentations in terms of whether particular groups of care workers have a right to strike under the law, whether these care workers are in the formal and informal sector, how this context impacts uh, the right to strike and collective action. And we think to, but the question of legality isn't, isn't the only question. So we think of kind of labor before modern systems of labor relations, the the Atlantic, Atlanta washerwoman strike of 1881, when thousands of African-American laundresses went on strike to demand 
better pay and working conditions was in a sense an illegal strike and that these, that these women didn't have the right to strike. But they saw in that collective action, in that mode of political action, the strike being the way that they would exercise power in their workplace and in their broader community. And then you can think of women's general strikes. And I think this gets to kind of Esther's comments on the, on, on the idea of a women's strike, thinking back to the Icelandic women's strike of 1975, for instance, demanding equal pay when 90% of Icelandic women were said to have refused to, to do both paid and unpaid care work. Uh, and then recent strikes that which are which fall within the, the, the legal boundaries of, of labor rela- uh, regulations, labor relations systems, like Australian child care workers, which which Maud has documented, and Stephanie is, as you say, in the in Quebec, where care workers, child care workers have had trade unions and the right to strike for some time. Um, but then you see domestic workers in just in 2017, for instance, in, in India and in Delhi who don't have a legal right to strike, uh, who went on strike, 4,000 domestic workers in a, in a suburb of Delhi went on strike to demand legal protections, including the right to take you know, collective action and exercise their power as care workers. But there's not only the question of legality, there's also a question of kind of consciousness and political capacities. And I think this is something that Maud has, has um, detailed in her work, the construction of care workers as kind of selfless and, and unwilling to strike because they're engaged in a labor of love and they're worried about the impact a strike might have on the recipients of their care. And this is something that care workers may think themselves. So in, in my research with home child care providers in New York City, the, the difference between the consciousness of, of care workers in New York City providing home child care and home child care providers in Quebec who do have the right to strike and, and can go on strike and do go on strike um, is remarkable. When I talk to those care workers, child care providers in New York City about would they ever think of going on strike, you know, exercising their their power via the strike, you know, they were shocked that the that the that the child care providers would ever go would ever go on strike. They they had very practical questions. They were worried about who were going to care for the children if they, if they went on strike, right? And this gets to very concrete questions about organizing, which I think, I think Stephanie covered in, um, uh, in your presentation, Stephanie, about, you know, who provides when care workers go on strike. You know, they're not striking a workplace that produces widgets or uh, cars. Um, you know, who provides care when care workers go on strike? And I think that's the question that comes up when we discuss care, stri- care strikes in both kind of the- theory in terms of theory of, of care strikes and the, the praxis of, of care workers and collective action. Um, you know, this, this, the strike wave we saw of teachers in, in places like West Virginia in the United States, you know, just a few years back, um, showed some examples of, of, of this in terms of teachers organizing with churches to provide hot meals that students would usually get at school and delivering them kind of door to door to their students. So really considering about how care is provided in the midst of a care strike in terms of care workers withdrawing withdrawing their labor. And I think that's, you know, the unions in Quebec show the importance of, of outreach to parents and community and, and building coalitions uh, with the providers of care and with parents and with the broader, with the broader community as well. So all presentations I, I thought were, were inspiring and challenging in terms of thinking about the theory and praxis of, of care workers and, and, and care strikes. So thank you all. Over to you, Maude. Thank you, Simon. Yes, I wanted to return to the idea of coalition and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to some of the things that Esther said uh, about uh, a coalition is not a home and a coalition is on the street. Um, and I think in mean, all of our of the speakers' presentations, we're really rich accounts of the the actual praxis of building um, new kinds of coalitions, um, the both in terms of the skills and the resources that it takes, the perseverance, the patience the ability to bear with uh, discomfort and disagreement. Um, 
but also they expanded for me the way that uh, so far uh, I had been thinking about the uh, the sort of parameters of those alliances um, and how it expanded massively to include sex workers, uh, but also uh, support staff in the case of um, uh, the Quebec case that Stephanie talked about that, you know, the, the strike did not stop until the pay agreement was reached that included support staff, cooking and cleaning staff that had, uh, you know, historically been excluded from um, the, uh, the, the pay and, and better conditions that professionalized educators have had access to. And uh, Monique talked about alliances with tipped workers and about the importance of building a care that works coalition, which I know that Mata Hari has been involved in over several years, um, but importantly, building that, that care that works coalition, but not on the backs of m migrant uh, care workers and, and nannies. So, so that for me, that really uh, brought to life the importance of, and difficulty, you know, the, the, uh, this, the real work of solidarity building and, and, and um, thanks. So thank you for sharing those with us. Okay, I think we have some time for questions now from our audience. Yeah, so we had some questions from the audience that were put in the chat. Um, one question, Esther, for you was, uh, someone wanted to know more about the, the the possible tensions or synergies in the relationship between childcare workers and sex workers in terms of the organizing. So, I mean, in some ways they're organized separately, right? They're different. They've kind of sprung from the same political project of the Women's Strike Assembly, but they're separate branches within. So United Voices of the World is a grassroots union predominantly in London. Um, actually the majority of their members are Latin American migrant cleaners um, and my first interaction with them was when I was working helping to in solidarity unionizing cleaners when I was at university um, so and that's the majority of their membership but they've got a few branches of different sectors um, and I think there are always tensions and that's actually part of the interesting thing is that I think we've also been undertaking over time quite a long-term project of political education around the sex worker rights movement in this country um with a whole variety of other people in this union um which has been a really interesting and valuable kind of project but i think and it means people have worked together with people they would just never have worked with before um and that that's a really useful but it is it's not always straightforward and i think it is about also meeting people where they're at a bit and not going in going we have all the answers because actually everyone has some sections of the answers um and so yeah i think that's maybe speaks to that is that they are separate they're not being organized literally together um but we definitely have generated difficult and interesting conversations that wouldn't have happened otherwise and we now take speeds all together at least once a year. Thanks, Esther. There was a question for Stephanie, and it was a question that I alluded to in my comments. Um, the question was around the uh, around this very question of who cares for the children while chair care, child care workers go on strike, and what kind of work you do as a union collectively to to think through that question and um, work with parents and community and could you go into kind of more detail about the the kind of practical aspects of that organizing yes yeah, sure um it was not a first strike huh? every time we have to bargain we use strike because it's legal like you said simon uh, usually we were saying uh, we the people were saying that we were taking parents in last stages and after the big um, the pandemic and the big confinement the people the, the parents has to stay home and work home uh, work uh, with their their kids going all around because the um, early childhood center were closed during the big co confinement well we had 
uh, only the the child from the um, the um, the people who were working in the hospital with the, the COVID people sick. So the most of the parents were uh, in the mode that they um, they did not have the choice to take care of their kids and work in the same time. So it shows the population of Quebec how important it was to have the early childhood centers to take care of the kids. But it shows in the same time that it's not the end of the world if it's closed one or two or three days. The parents' job is, I mean, they choose to have kids. They, they know they're going to have to take care of their kids sometimes. Sometimes the kids are sick and they need to uh, have a, a sick day at their work to take care of their kids. So if the early childhood center is closed, it's, it's, it's very the same thing. They have to take care of their kids. So if we, um, when we do the strike, just the parents stay with the kids. And that's why it's so important to have the parents with us, behind us, uh, in, our re in our request. And for this time, the parents realized how important was our job because they, they had to stay three, three months uh, at home with kids and they realized, my God, it's so hard to be with my kids all the time. How can you do that? You have eight kids in your group and you, you do that 40 uh, hours per week. Oh, my God. So they, they, like, they, they realized how important we were and they realized how, how we were not paid enough and unrecognized enough. So that's why all together we can join and we have the support of the parents. And they were saying, go on, do the strike. I will take, I will keep my kids home to, to make sure you can go and fight with the govern with the government, you know. And they were coming with us in the mobilization and on the street asking for better condition for uh, for the educators in the childhood centers. And even they uh, they were um, they were understand they understand why we were fighting for other job title too because uh, when the parents come at the early childhood centers bring his kids he see that the the, the people's doing the the lunch for the kids it's so important in the group and the people in the office are important too there is not only the people taking care of the kids that are important so it's all the, the solidarity with the parents and the, the worker that made it make it possible made it possible to do the strikes, and I think it's gonna it's gonna be uh, easier the next time because we have to do that bargain every three years. <laughs> so the next fight will be easier, I think, because the parents realize how how it's necessary to have the early childhood centers in, uh, in their life so they can go back to work and, and stay on the labor market, especially for women. They, they, it's, it's really important for them. So I think the, the important part, like you said, Simon, is the thing that it's legal for us to do the strike. And it's not so bad for the kids to stay home with their parents for a few days. <laughs> that's it yeah thanks stephanie and, and for those people who are not familiar with the with the context of, of quebec i mean progressive employment and labor legislation ensures that parents uh do have a right to a paid sick day as well so parents ability to be able to withdraw their own labor in their workplace to take care of their child uh while while the child care workers at the um, centers are on strike is, you know, is predicated on that, that they, that they also have a right, you know, a, a paid sick day that they can take while their uh, early childhood educators go on, go on strike, exercise their right to strike, withdraw their labor. Um, Maud, you have a question for Monique and Esther. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Uh, I was just wondering about the different strategies that um, you talked about and how uh, different they are from strikes and whether you see them as complementary. So as you talked about occupations and about shutting down Soho and Monique, you, you also talked about um, uh, negotiating uh, contracts and um, 
and political education. So yeah, I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about whether the uh, workers you organize with, um, whether they, yeah, what their, um, how they're interested in strikes and their alignment with uh, these different strategies. I can go first. Um, so I think they are well. They are complementary. Strikes are is the highest of disruptive power, right? But for people to build a collective consciousness and self-esteem individually and also collectively, you have to build upon it over time. Especially for people in the United States who are historically marginalized, they might they feel like they are oppressed and downtrodden so much that it takes years and years and years enough to being fed up enough or the conditions are right enough to have a strike. Um, strikes are, you know, oftentimes I feel like there's different varying levels within a membership, a readiness of it. But whenever we need, whenever we have to align on the critical mass, that's only when the, the strike can be effective. The strikes can look silly if you don't have enough numbers, right? Because there's not enough impacts. But then you have to really assess your power for you to build, that's why knowing your power and your your opponents and their power and being able to assess your mats and power to overcome them, right? So for us, the, the work that we do with the strategies with smaller wins is a way to build collective confidence and criti critical consciousness to get to that level. Because in the United States, particularly, we have detention and deportation. That is something that criminalizes um, immigrants and people of color and the prison system. So you have to be ready enough to have enough power that you can fight against detention, deportation, and, um, and um, police whenever time comes. Because otherwise, you are putting your membership's um, uh, life and their livelihood and their families um, at risk. So for us, it's always assessing that all the time and being ready to strike for that moment. So for us, all of our strategies in the meantime are around um, mitigating the harm that they're facing now, building conf confidence, and also to assess the, the pushback that we get from our opponents too. It's always constantly assessment all the time for us to get to that stage when we're ready to do critical math around disruptive power for strikes. But that is something in the wheelhouse that it will take time and a lot of um, awareness and strategy. Yeah, I can come in as well. Um, I think there's a couple of things I'll say in that I think strikes are a really crucial strategy, obviously, in labor struggle. I think they're what we have to win, but they're what we have to win workplace by workplace, right? Um, and that's big. And especially when the unionization I've been doing with childcare workers is private nurseries. Um, I think there's actually a lot of potential for some big campaigns around um, some of the big chains of nurseries that exist, like, and that actually dominate the market, like Busy Bees and Bright Horizons, for those familiar with the market here. Um, but I think on the question of the mass mobilization, in the, the way it's perceived in Latin America, where they are miles ahead of us um, in their organizing, uh, and I'm kind of drawing on the work of Veronica Gago here um, in Feminist International, which is a brilliant book, um, to think of the strike, not just as a traditional labor strike, and to actually push back against the unions. And I think this touches actually on the question of legality that you were raising, Simon, in that you can't legally have a political strike in this country, but what does it mean when everyone just stops? And I think it's a really interesting question. It's what we've been trying to push out. And we have had people strike in that, like, we've had people withdraw their labour in a whole variety of ways from their jobs on International Women's Day every year now. Um, and it's not mass. And that is the problem. We need to work out how we massify that and create the space. But what the mass mobilisations do, I think, is make visible the work in an interesting way where when we mobilize we always have childcare, we always have food we have mainly being provided by our male comrades and we create ways of doing political action that make the work that's being done clear and particularly when we're thinking through 
unpaid reproductive labour as well as the paid reproductive labour. I think those spaces are really important. Uh, and as Veronica Gaga would say, it's kind of up to the feminist movement to redefine the strike. And that's not to lose the labour strike. I, don't, I think it's really important to emphasise that. But to kind of expand its boundaries out, to expand the concept of who is and isn't able to strike, um, and that that's going to mean being in the streets. Yeah, and making visible that work, yeah, like you say, is important, so important. Uh, we had a question from Caitlin in the chat. Um, Caitlin was wondering how or if the organizers here use any strategies to build a movement amongst childcare workers who may feel a tension between their professional identities as care workers and being seen as militant activists by the public. So Caitlin uh, has done some research with child co-workers in Ontario and Canada, and they say that they, they, they have experienced a tension between their professional caring identities and being seen as an, as an advocate for their wages and working conditions. Does anybody want to take that on? It's a tension between a kind of professional identity and being seen as militant activists. Stephanie, maybe you're about situated in Quebec to... Um, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, the, if I understand the question well, um, in Quebec, like I said, there's 30,000 worker in childcare services and only uh, one third of the the party wait, i don't know if i re don't remember how to say that but um the three party of the 30,000 worker are uh, unionized and all the one that not are not unionized was looking at us fighting for our conditions and hoping that they're that they're going to be grateful of this that they are gonna enjoy it after because the governments what what the what he agreed to us he gave it to everybody else in the same times so yes we can seems to be only activists but we're not fighting only for ourselves for unions people we're fighting for all the workers in child care services in quebec i hope it will uh, have an effect uh, more than that and I can I can totally say that in Quebec there is everything passes by the negotiation of the unions, but it brings all the profession up and it brings all the the condition of every childcare worker up. So I think it's a good thing to being seen as an uh, early childhood worker and an activist. It's like it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good association for me. I don't know if it's an answer well. <laughs> yes, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, Monique, you wanted to chime in on this as well? Yes, this is one of the, the initial tensions that come from anyone that comes into the organization, that they get fearful of the politicization of what they're, they're facing. And it's our job as organizers to dismantle that and also like descale that politicization. Why is it has to be a political act to want to make change? In your life right what creates that condition or the hesitancy so when even in our initial orientations whenever we teach people about their rights it's like an initial entryway for people to realize aha there's something wrong with what's happening right now and even seeing multiple other people facing the same thing but that aha moment is when people are like oh wow i'm one minute ago i was a child care worker that accepted this wage but i'm learning that from another worker that I'm being exploited. But that can easily be twisted like, well, how dare you like push back? Well, I'm just, I can't pay my bills. I can't feed my family. That within itself shouldn't have to be a political act to want it to be different. So for us, we try to create a culture where it's community oriented and feeling more like um, friendly, right? Like the antagonistic uh, fight of like fighting back to get what you deserve that shouldn't we don't have to have that narrative i think i think that's the the evolution that we are in in the world right like um especially in the united states there's so much um what's it called binary around like 
the boss against the, the worker, right? But what about we reframe, what if all of us can make things better for all of us and more sustainable? And that's the work we have to do around the narrative shifts. And whenever we get to that tension where it does become the fight, this is when we fight. But before then, we have to figure out umbrellas for us to push back against. So even right now in the United States, like um, we're also seeing a divide, in, uh, particularly whenever we're organizing multiracially with uh, white American workers and new immigrant workers. And because immigrant workers are coming from international contexts where protests and uh, fight back against their government is a culture that they come from, or even surviving a genocide and war. So there's always this tension between the uh, respectability of American, um, respectability of American career people who are like, no, you have to be very uh, docile, have to be just accepting, be professionalized, and versing workers who are also coming in and, and, and accepting or even just force upon that condition. So that within itself is a racial tension. So the more solidarity we build against uh, with workers that are white and also uh, with um, multiracial people of color, there's an aha notice because like a lot of immigrants don't even realize a lot of white Americans are being exploited regardless of their, their racial identity. But in their minds, they think that they are also, they're not, they're protected, right? And then the immigrant workers are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. So without those conversations, they will continue building these, these narratives that these binaries that don't necessarily have to exist, right? So that's the, the essence and the power that's, uh, that is potential for this. So when we notice that tension, there is a tension, but how do we bridge that to build the collective power? And that's like the savviness of, that we have to do as organizers. Yeah, the, the real hard work, the nuts and bolts of coalition building, right? And building across mm -hmm. divides and difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Esther, I see you have your hand up. I don't know if it's a legacy hand or? No, I can come in very quick. I just think to me, yeah. it's quite a simple answer in a funny way of, I think we can see the organizing we do as an act of care in itself, in that there is care in fighting to build something that's better. Um, and that sometimes care is militant and that care isn't always this soft cuddly thing. And I think that that's a really important thing to try and hold. Add another question from James. Thank you all for sharing your expertise. Um, I'm interested in whether any of the speakers have a sense of how we can begin to unite informal and formal care workforces and whether strategy will uh, need to change depending on kind of country context. So we've touched on this a little bit, but more specifically, uniting informal and formal care work workforces, how to do that, some of the barriers, how to overcome those barriers. And feel free, Ma, to um, feel that question yourself as well. <laughs> I can speak a little bit to that. Um, sure, yeah. In the most recent, yeah, in the most recent years after we passed the domestic workers law, um, it actually brought a lot of attention uh, to other care, child care workers that who are not domestic workers about the rights of child care workers in general. And it's pretty been it's been pretty interesting since then because uh, domestic workers who are informal workers in the United States, they, they also, because of um, poor labor conditions, also are transient to other care sector work. So they often become uh, child care center based people, they become early educators, or they, they even uh, domestic workers formally could also be au pairs. So um, the only way that we've been able to build spaces that are um, that bring people together around um, even doing conferences that that we say that it's a child care or the care conference right so that anyone that identifies as a caregiver or child caregiver can come and meet that and then have the noticing across sectors that they're they're experiencing a shared exploitation across sectors no matter what they are because a lot of times domestic workers think that child care workers in centers are have it great you know because it looks formalized it looks professionalized they feel proud of it they don't have to hide it amongst the peers and they learn through conversations that they're facing the same things or even worse, that, but it's it's covered with a rosy branding and structural like shaping, right? Um, so, so for us, like how do we create that big umbrella? And we've been seeing so much 
uh, possibility through organizing au pairs, uh, child care center workers, domestic workers, even um, unpaid, un unpaid family workers, uh, child care workers at home, like grandparents or aunts that, that are, are cousins that stay at home and take care of the children so that other parents can go to work. Just, uh, just uplifting care as a labor, regardless of what, how you're getting paid or unpaid, right? So that's been um, such a key mobilizing factor in creating this basic shared consciousness um, and politicizing people. Just seeing other questions in the chat. Um, this question from Peter, did the lessons learned by nursing unions, especially those that represented long-term care, uh, shape the strategies used by care workers in Quebec? So this is a question for Stephanie. Did the lessons learned by nursing unions, especially those representing, um, those, uh, representing workers in long-term care, uh, inform kind of the strategies of, uh, child care workers? I guess, so is there any kind of across care workers in different sectors, the discussion yeah. around strategy and collective bargaining and strikes and so on? Um, surely we learn about the experience of other sectors and in our unions, I'm with the CSM, and we have um, 300 people unions with us. And there is a lot of sectors and there is people, nurse uh, working in hospital and there is teacher too. There is uh, people working in the, uh, every kind, every kind of job. So we learn about each other's fight and we uh, make strategy. And uh, one of the, um, the biggest thing that changed with the time it's the fact that we negotiate di directly with the govern the government. Um, there is a there is a way in Quebec like um, the government is part of <laughs> lots of uh, public cares, and um, the special thing about the early childhood centers is there's uh, the, the there is the bus and the, the worker, like uh, Monique says, but there's uh, the government's paying for the services in early childhood centers. So we have to negotiate with the government and the bosses in the same time at the same table. And all the, 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 the manager of the daycare of the early childhood center, they, they join together to make an association, um, employers association. So we have to negotiate with them and government in the same time. And it's, it's a special thing uh, for early childhood centers. We don't see that kind of, um, of uh, bargaining table in other sectors. So we have to build our history. We, we, we can use strategy for strategy from other sectors, but there are so specific, specific things for our sectors that we have to, uh, make the story and learn about our own fight during the time. That's it. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Monique, for really thoughtful responses, which to very thoughtful questions too from our audience. Thank you to the audience, audience for kind of collectively with us, with us thinking through these questions of, of the theory and, and praxis of, of care workers and collective action and care strikes. It's now time to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Uh, Pramila Nadison has joined us all the way from South Africa, but Pramila is a professor of history at Bernard College in Columbia in New York City. She is most interested in the activisms and visions of liberation of, of poor and working class women of color. Pramila has been involved in social justice organizing for many decades and published extensively on the multiple meanings of feminism, alternative labor movements, and grassroots community organizing. She is the author of two award-winning books, Welfare Warriors, The Welfare Rights Movement in the United States, which uh, 
I'm going to hold up right here, which I've taken off my bookshelf to show. <laughs> and also of Household Workers Unite, the untold story of African-American women who built a movement. Uh, Pramila, I've learned so much from these works and your work in, generally, uh, in general. And thank you for joining us today. Pramila is currently writing a biography of, of South African singer and anti-apartheid activist, Marian Makeba. So we all look forward to reading that. And we're very much looking forward to hearing from Pramila today. So Pramila, welcome. Thank you so much, um, Simon, uh, for that introduction. And I also just want to express my gratitude to both Simon and Maud for organizing this really rich discussion. Um, one of the things about being in South Africa is we have something called load shedding, where we uh, lose uh, power for periods of time. So I have been on and off the call today. Um, so I missed some of what was said earlier. Uh, but what I did hear was very inspiring and uh, very happy to, to hear all of you and to see Monique again. Uh, hi, Monique. Um, so I'm also finishing, in addition to working on my biography of Mary McCabe, I'm also finishing a book on the care economy at this moment. Uh, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but I'll be happy to talk about it during the Q&A. Uh, one of the intentions of this gathering, as the subtitle uh, about critical race uh, tells us, is the, is the intention of centering race and migration in care work. So in that spirit, I'd like to focus my comments on women of color in order to think with you about what centering race and migration mean. Directing our attention to the experiences of women of color is important because as Bell Hooks wrote nearly 40 years ago, analyzing the lives of black women on the margins has a great deal to teach us about the center. That is, their experiences are not distinctive or particular, but rather it illuminates structural inequalities and how power operates. And I believe that they also offer lessons on how to organize. The Combahee River Collective, a Boston-based group, also looked to the most marginalized to craft a liberatory vision of an anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, and anti-capitalist world. As they explained in um, a, a document that they wrote in 1977, and I'm quoting them, we might use our position at the bottom to make a clear leap into revolutionary action. If Black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. The Combahee River Collective articulates what I refer to as a radical woman of color feminism. It's an integrated analysis of race, class, and gender, which is not the same as identity politics, which I see as a kind of individualized identity. A radical woman of color feminism looks at systemic materialist connections between race, class, and gender. And I build here on the work of people like Robin Kelly, Angela Davis, and Dorothy Roberts. So I reject the distinction between social oppression and class exploitation, and instead consider how class and class exploitation are lived through race and gender. Centering race, I think perhaps most importantly when we're talking about social reproduction, requires looking at divisions within care work or within social reproduction. So social reproduction is a broad category of labor that includes healthcare, education, food preparation, cleaning, washing, dishes and clothing, elder care, child care, disability care. And it's the labor that is necessary to sustain human life. Um, and as many domestic worker rights groups say, um, and as the International Domestic Worker Federation also says, it's the work that makes all other work possible. So we can talk about both paid and unpaid labor. In terms of unpaid labor, um, I wanna say that nearly all women and some men engage in the unpaid labor of social reproduction for their own families and communities. And so there's a kind of uh, universality about unpaid labor. Uh, we all have an investment in care work. Um, at the same time, 
how women are able to cope is determined to a large degree by their race and class background. Because social reproduction is largely privatized, some women who are well off have the resources to outsource this work, while other women cannot. Many poor women are unable to even provide basic care for their own families, and this has been exacerbated with the dismantling of social welfare systems. Wealthier women hire poor women of color, they hire domestic workers, childcare workers, home health care aides at much lower wages than they earn. Hiring domestic workers enables middle class women to purchase their own narrowly defined feminist liberation, and that is professional success and freedom from housework. In this way, the labor of social reproduction contributes to class and racial inequality among women. So all is not equal when it comes to unpaid housework. There's also hierarchy within the paid sector of social reproduction. How workers are treated and compensated, their legal rights and the kinds of work they do varies greatly depending on social location. What does this inequality look like? Legal scholar Dorothy Roberts explains um, that there are two tracks of social reproductive care. One is what she refers to as front room or spiritual or nurturing care work that is dominated by white women who tend to be better educated and higher paid. This includes teachers and registered nurses. On the other side, we have what she calls back room menial or non-nurturing work, work that's performed by women of color. And this includes janitorial work, laundering and cafeteria work. Evelyn Nakano Glenn, the sociologist, refers to the stratification within this sector as a racial division of reproductive labor. Rossell Perenia, another scholar in her work on Filipina domestic workers, has referred to uh, the international division of reproductive labor to describe the migration of women abroad to care for the children of families in wealthier countries. So there are divisions that are about race, but also about documentation status, language, and educational background. So we should look uh, at both the inequalities within the nation state, as well as between nations. I, I wanna provide a concrete example here. Um, uh, Edith Mendoza came, from, came to the United States from the Philippines in January, 2015 to work for the family of a German diplomat in New Jersey. Among other things, her labor contract specified that she would do light housework, get paid $10 an hour for a 35 hour work week with time and a half for overtime and be guaranteed Sundays off, transportation and room and board. Edith was responsible for cooking three meals a day, cleaning the three story, six bedroom, six bath house, doing the laundry, taking care of the outdoors, including shoveling snow, and caring for four small boys. She worked 80 to 100 hours a week and was never paid overtime. On her day off, her employer bombarded her with questions about where she was going, instilling fear in her about leaving the house at all. Although she wanted to leave, she was concerned that if she did, she would lose her visa and become undocumented. When she developed a serious health issue, her employer refused to let her go to the doctor. She went anyway. Her employer threatened to fire her and have her deported if she ever did that again. She escaped in 2016 and contacted the, uh, the Damayan Migrant Workers Association. Damayan is a Filipino organization in New York City um, that I've worked with for several years. It was founded in 2002 by Linda Olakon, who was employed as a domestic worker for 18 years. It is a worker led democratic grassroots organization. The Mayan practices mutual aid. It runs a cooperative and rescues people in labor trafficking situations. Mm -hmm. Nearly all members, and there are both men and women, are domestic workers or low wage service workers, and many are undocumented. With the Mayan's help, Edith was able to secure her visa and bring her children from the Philippines to join her and file a lawsuit against her former employers. The case was dismissed, not for lack of evidence of abuse, but because her employers had diplomatic immunity. 
Never, nevertheless, the role of the Bayan was critical. It is an anti-imperialist, anti-sexist, anti-racist organization that ties the particular situation of Filipino migrant workers to the long history of US imperialism. They critique both the US and the International Monetary Fund, Fund policies that have impoverished the country and spawned a labor, a, a labor brokerage system that has become the primary source of employment for, for many Filipino families. This example um, highlights how the history of social reproductive labor is distinctly different for women of color. Because of entrenched poverty in the Philippines, Edith was forced to leave her two children at home and travel halfway across the world for work in order to sustain her family. She found herself enmeshed in a visa system that offered little recourse and essentially kept her in servitude. Social reproduction is often framed as an extension of women's household labor and understood as caring labor. The dominant narrative is that care work is devalued and workers are underpaid because of discourses of love and gendered assumptions that women are naturally caring. Women of color often do the dirty work, the physically taxing work, the janitorial labor, not the work that is associated with the white middle-class gendered norms of care and emotion. In fact, those norms rarely apply to women of color who are more often seen as workers than as mothers. Of course, gender is important, um, but we have to move beyond gender as the sole or even the primary analytical lens. Um, and rather consider this work through an intersectional lens. As we consider either organizing or theorizing about social reproduction, we have to ask which workers are we talking about? Much of the writing and analysis around care work has emerged from the experiences of white women, often in the global north. We develop a different analysis if we shift our gaze to women in the global south and women of color in the global north. From the vantage point of women of color, as, as Edith's story illustrates, there's a different origin story for the devaluation of this labor. For most paid domestic workers, the devaluation of their labor did not originate with gender inequality in the home, but rather with racial inequality in the labor market. Paid domestic work is shaped by power and rooted in coercion. Um, straddling the line between exploitation and expropriation. Women of color are often forced to work in other people's homes or in institutionalized service work. The paid labor of social reproduction for women of color has a more direct lineage emerging out of slavery, racism, imperialism, settler colonialism, and economic, and economic inequality rather than the family and household. We could examine the snatching of indigenous girls from their families and communities and being pressed into domestic service in the US, Canada, and Australia. Or we could look to the history of slavery. Even well after the end of chattel slavery, women of African descent remained confined to low wage coercive service work. There's sometimes a conflation of this work with love and care. And we saw some of this during the pandemic when workers were praised for their devotion and given pats on the back and free donuts. Focusing on women of color forces us to grapple with the language of care. Their experiences dispel any assumptions that care work is about love and emotion. Edith certainly wasn't there because she cared. Care as a framing can be useful uh, because it is a big tent that can be used to build solidarity and connections. We all care, we all need to be cared for, but it's also problematic because it exceptionalizes the labor, marking it as different from other kinds of work, when in fact it is not. And most organizers I know, and I know many on this call, don't wanna be seen as special, rather they want the same rights and privileges as other workers. The language of care also masks distinctions and differences. Because many women of color engage in social reproductive labor, but not care work, the language of care universalizes the experiences of white women. 
erase, um, it erases the non-nurturing work that so many women engage in. And it invisibilizes the growing number of men in these occupations. Um, as a side note, I would also just like to distinguish between um, care as a language of coercion and care as a radical practice. So there are a number of examples, uh, contemporary examples, but also historical examples of anti-hierarchical, anti-capitalist collective care models that are part of social movements and working towards social transformation. So my critique of care is the, is the care that is tied to the capitalist economy. I would argue that developing a broad-based movement requires using a more encompassing term. But this is not just about nomenclature. Even people who rely on the term social reproduction often privilege nurturing work. Attending to differences within the sector is critical, and it will enable us to build a diverse movement and speak to the needs and interests of different kinds of workers. I would propose that we dispense with the language of care and shift the conceptual understanding of this work. In fact, the language of love and care has often been used uh, to extract labor, uh, to, to uh, expect that domestic workers and other workers do more than what's expected of them to stay late um, and to go above and beyond the call of duty because they care and because they love. And the language of care is also sometimes used to, in, to, in, to inhibit organizing. And this speaks to one of the last questions that we just got um, in the panel. Um, and that is there is a moral imperative uh, for caregivers to put care receivers first and to be selfless. And somehow if care workers are organizing, are going on strike, are mobilizing, that somehow they are selfish. Um, and it's that more moral imperative, uh, the expectation that people ought to have an emotional investment in their work, uh, rather than to understand their work as a job, uh, one which deserves adequate pay uh, and benefits. Sylvia Federici, one of the leaders of the Wages for Housework movement in the 1970s, argued that housewives were compelled to do housework because it was transformed, um, in her words, into an act of love. I think the very idea of a strike is a refusal of this compulsion and a rejection of the politics of love and care. Since the onset of the pandemic, we've seen a wave of organizing and demonstrations, actually some of the largest in generations, grocery workers, our house workers, teachers, nurses. Um, there's been, there have been rent strikes and demands for childcare assistance. Essential workers uh, who reject the empty gestures of gratitude and are demanding adequate pay and protective equipment. It's perhaps one of the clearest indications of how social reproduction has become a, class, a site of class struggle. And there's a growing body of new scholarship on, on, on social reproduction. And I'm thinking here of the work of Tithi, uh, uh, Tithi Batarcha and Sue Ferguson. Um, but also I, Maude uh, Pierre just wrote a new book on maternal workers, which I have not yet had a chance to read, although I was, I did have the opportunity to join her book talk a couple of days ago. This new scholarship really expands how we understand care work and considers the possibilities for solidarity among social reproductive workers. Some of the earlier scholarship on social reproduction from the 1970s and, and 80s was more wedded to unpaid labor in the family and home. Recent scholarship has incorporated paid work work in institutionalized settings, as well as struggles around consumer prices, pensions, uh, migrant workers, welfare, um, struggles around water, access to water and quality schools. And I think it's an important step forward in terms of how we center race and migration in social reproduction. There are, of course, scholars who have long utilized an intersectional framework to write about race, organizing, and social reproduction. And people such as David McNally and Sue Ferguson have acknowledged this work and have taken other scholars to task for the erasure of women of color scholarship. 
I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking um, about domestic worker organizing, which has been a robust field of study for women of color and I think has really been foundational to understanding how women of color have defined social reproduction and how the politics of race has become integrated into those frameworks. Um, there's a long list of people who've written about domestic worker organizing. Grace Chang, Bonnie Thornton Dill, Tara Hunter are just a few people. Um, but I'm also uplifting this movement because I think it's instructive for how social reproductive workers and other workers can organize. Domestic workers have always resisted the terms of their occupation, either through individual resistance, that is day-to-day -day acts of subversion or quitting, or by organizing other workers. Um, and there are many examples of this, and I'm so glad that Adriana and Monique were on this call today, and they, they talked uh, very eloquently about some of the contemporary organizing that's going on. I'm going to focus my comments on the early iter earlier iteration of this organizing based on my prior research. In the 1960s and 70s, domestic workers began to organize locally in cities around the U.S., Cleveland, Detroit, Atlanta, New York City, and they came together in 1971 and formed the first ever national organization of domestic workers, the Household Technicians of America. It had chapters all around the country and a membership of 25,000. The movement was comprised primarily of African-American women, although not only. Um, women who sought to restructure the occupation of household labor and overturn the culture of servitude. They refused to enter through the back door, to take hand-me-downs in lieu of payment. They refused to be referred to as girls or by their first names, by their employers. They refused to be uh, to serve at the beck and call of their employers. They pushed for higher pay, professionalization, federally protected rights, and a contractual relationship that specified the tax, the tasks for which workers would be responsible. These workers were and uh, often still are outside the mainstream labor movement. They did not have the legal right to organize and bargain collectively. Because they were outside the boundaries of the formal labor movement, they have been and are developing innovative strategies that may have relevance to other precarious workers. And for me, that's another example of how marginalized workers often have a lot to teach us, right? So I just want to highlight a few uh, of their strategies um, as a way to think about uh, the care strike and sort of connections that could be made um, across uh, time and space. Uh, domestic workers in the 60s and 70s built alliances, uh, particularly between unpaid and paid workers around uh, unpaid and paid care workers around an agenda to improve the status of the most marginalized workers. It was an alliance premised on a common understanding that anyone engaged in household work uh, was negatively impacted by the devaluation of it. Josephine Hewlett, who was a field organizer for the household technicians, explained in an interview, I'm going to quote her here, there's a sense in which all women are household workers. And unless we stop being turned against each other, unless we organize together, we're never gonna make this country see household work for what it really is, human work, not just woman's work, a job that deserves dignity, fair pay and respect. So for domestic workers, building solidarity meant developing an expansive politics around social reproduction based on the leadership and experiences of women of color who are the most marginalized. They also used public venues as sites of organizing. So they reached out to other workers on buses and subways, um, in public parks and in laundry rooms. In this way, the movement blurred the boundaries of home, workplace, community, and public spaces. Um, and saw uh, these as deeply intertwined in terms of labor exploitation and movement building. Domestic worker organizing was rooted in community associations rather than traditional labor unions. They developed alliances with women's organizations and neighborhood groups. 
they embra embraced workers who were documented and undocumented and organized across lines of language, ethnicity, race, and culture. They were the forerunners of what today we call social movement unionism that has the aim of building not just union membership, but community support. So they engaged uh, in building collective power, although they didn't engage in collective bargaining. They advocated state-based rather than employer-granted labor rights um, since they changed employers frequently. State-based benefits would protect all workers regardless of who employed them or whether they were able to negotiate generous contracts. So it was a model of organizing that is suitable for a contingent workforce. And they relied on storytelling as a base building strategy. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because I think Monique did a really wonderful job explaining that. Um, I'll just say that it wasn't evident to domestic workers in the 1970s that they were a, that they were a political constituency. Remember, this was the first national organization. And so storytelling became one means to build that collective identity and to foster solidarity. So what is the takeaway um, from thinking about um, some of the examples I shared, as well as the history of domestic worker organizing? What is the takeaway in terms of how we move forward? I think any campaign around social reproduction must take into account the history of capitalism, imperialism, the carceral state, racism, slavery, and settler colonialism. The exploitation of domestic workers is deeply intertwined with these other structures of inequality. We have to develop a broad platform that includes higher wages, benefits, and labor protections for all workers, whether documented or not, as well as an expanded safety net that supports everyone. Social reproductive organizing has the potential to transform not only labor relations, but the very meaning of what it means to live in a democratic society. Domestic worker organizing has even more relevance today um, than in prior decades, in part because it's offering a way forward for the growing sector of precarious workers. Domestic workers were the original precarious workers. They foreshadowed the labor conditions of a growing number of workers globally. Um, because they didn't have labor protections, because they didn't have the right to organize and bargain collectively, because they didn't have pension funds. Um, although our models of labor organizing are often centered on industrial workers, the percentage of industrial workers in many Western countries is rapidly diminishing. In the U.S., manufacturing workers are 9% of the workforce, were 9% of the workforce in, in 2019. I'm using 2019 statistics because uh, I think it was more representative. The pandemic was kind of an odd period. Um, but service workers, on the other hand, were 80% of the workforce. Social reproduction is redefining what labor organizing it looks like under neoliberalism. And finally, organizing around social reproduction, I think, is an example of how working class resistance can take multiple forms, from housing anti-eviction campaigns to immigrant rights, from prison divest to Black Lives Matter to welfare rights. It suggests that we think not about trade unionism or labor organizing or even care work, but about building a broad-based working class movement that insists on support for all people, whether they work or not, or whether they care or not. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Pramila, for that incredibly rich talk. I mean, you really moved from the kind of theoretical and the abstract to the concrete and historical, and then and then back again. And um, leaving us with a vision of what a powerful working class movement that incorporates uh, the lens of social reproduction, incorporates the lens of, of thinking through race and migration critically uh, would produce in terms of 
the campaigns it focuses on, the type of collective action it values, and the type of workers it sees itself as, as representing and including. So thank you very much for that. We're going to open it up now to questions from the audience. Um, Maud, would you like to lead things off while I move over to the chat? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Pramila. That was um, really inspiring. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what you see as the challenges of organizing in a neoliberal age, given the historical research that you've conducted. Um, do you think there are new tactics and new repertoires of organizing that are needed. Um, I was thinking also about your work, Simon, uh, and um, if I'm if I remember rightly in in your book, you write about the strategies of uh, home child care workers and how they sort of played the city of New York at their own game by using the language of choice and by saying actually we our choice our preference is for our children to go to daycares with unionized workers and and they were able to use that in order to gain uh, a whole range of benefits um so yeah i was just wondering about about the sort of the changing tactics that are needed and the the sort of um the past and the future i guess mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to hear from Simon first, since you wrote the book on neoliberalism and organizing. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to remember my argument now, but it's, it, I think what the home child care providers in New York and what the home child care providers in New York, they're, they're providing publicly subsidized care. Um, and the subsidies are state subsidies are going to women who are on uh, um, temporary assistance for needy families or what would probably known as welfare um, the the way the state restructured child care in the wake of welfare reform was to say that in the name of providing uh, poor and working class women with choice that these women should have the right to choose uh, any type of care that they wish. So they could use their subsidy or their voucher for non-union care. And the subsidy and the, uh, and the value of the subsidy and the voucher meant that the non-union care providers providing that care would be actually paid very little. And I think in what we saw in New York and across the United States when it comes to home child care providers organizing is kind of turning the neoliberal discourse of choice back on its head. Um, or upside down and saying, or, 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 or subverting it and saying that real choice, real choice for poor and working class women means the choice to have not only our care labor valued, but to have the choice to choose to have our children uh, in care settings in which the women providing the care have their labor valued as well and have access to union, have access to, to, basic, to basic labor rights. So I think it's one way to think through how neoliberal discourses can kind of be, um, they're, they're incredibly powerful, um, they're incredibly pervasive, but they can also be used um, subversive, can be, they can also be subverted in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent way to think about it because I think certainly when people have choice, right? Uh, there's all kinds of choices they can make. <laughs> they can make radical choices. They can make progressive choices. The choices don't always have to be, uh, you know, within the framework of neoliberal capitalism <laughs> and, and what the expectation is that people should be independent and self-reliant. Uh, and so that, that's a really excellent example, Simon. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, for me, neoliberalism offers, you know, a lot of challenges, obviously. Um, I think the dismantling of the social welfare, the entitlement associated with social welfare has, uh, 
you know, hit poor families very hard. You know, we've seen alongside uh, the dismantling of welfare, the expansion of the carceral state. And so you have families who are struggling, who are unable to find work, um, who uh, don't have, you know, a basic source of income that they can rely on. Um, and that makes it hard for people to organize, you know, on some practical level, if, if you know, you're having trouble feeding your kids or, you know, if you're unhoused, you know, how do you begin to organize and mobilize um, in that context? At the same time, I think, uh, I think neoliberalism offers some opportunities. And I think what, what Simon just, just talked about is one of them. Um, but, you know, my view of the welfare state, and I'm speaking it from the US perspective here, since that's what I know best, but the New Deal welfare state was instituted in the 1930s in part to suppress radicalism. <laughs> um, it was as a way to quell dissent, to offer some concessions to the working class. And the welfare state created a structure that did provide a certain, um, some economic benefits to the poor and the working class, but it also recreated and reinforced gender and racial inequalities. Um, and the National Labor Relations Act, which is the act that uh, gives American workers the right to organize and bargain collectively, also served as a way to channel labor organizing, but also exclude certain sectors from labor organizing. I think one of the things that's become clear to many workers uh, uh, in the US today is the utter failure of the government <laughs> to, to attempt to resolve uh, the crisis, what seems to be a crisis of capitalism, but I would call an economic crisis. Um, and, the, and then to begin to look internally, to look at alternative strategies, to look outside of the NLRB, for example, to figure out how workers can organize, which is where I think the care strike also fits in, right? It's people who are not looking to negotiate with employers necessarily, but are attempting to make a broader political statement um, about care work. We had a question from the chat, Pramila, which I'll, I'll put to you because the chat's hidden from us who are in this room. The, um, the question was about, uh, well, partly about the conflation of work with, with love and care. And um, it says that in your talk, you said that the, the, the care, uh, care as a framing is useful, but it's also problematic because it exceptionalizes the labor. Um, I think there's been debates within within feminism about about you know a feminist ethic of care and uh, that can border on exceptionalizing care uh, and distinguishing it from lab from labor and from from work and therefore distinguishing it from the the demands of other workers in terms of rights and recognition and social protections. Could you maybe unpack that a little bit more? So, so the person's asking, you know. Could you unpack why it's why it's problematic to exceptionalize exceptionalize the labor mm -hmm. of care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the arguments about why care work is exceptional center on the emotional component of the labor, as well as its uh, rootedness in um, women's unpaid labor in the household. This is labor. The argument goes that has historic that women have historically done in the household for no pay. Um, it is work that uh, involves an emotional commitment and emotional investment, unlike other kinds of work. Um, and there is that kind of care work. There are preschool teachers, there are, there are nannies, right? I make an argument, um, and I, I've written a longer article about this, so I can't go into all of that right now, but that those demands of those workers invest emotionally are actually a form of economic exploitation. And Arlie Hochschild, um, um, in a book that she wrote in the 1980s, calls this emotional labor, right? And so we have to understand the ways in which employers expect, and I don't, I think should not expect, workers to invest emotionally. That does not mean that a worker shouldn't uh, 
kiss a child when they when they have a scraped knee because that's what the child needs or put a band-aid on a scraped knee those are acts of care those are practices of care that i think might be part of the job but the emotional investment is not necessarily part of the job you don't actually have to like the child to know that you have to put a band-aid on the child's knee um, so I think that's one thing is how does the notion of care and the expectation of care, which is often the foundation for the uh, for exceptionalizing the labor, how does that fit into how we think of labor exploitation? Um, and the other thing I would say about that is part of the argument I was trying to make is that care work is just really one small piece of the labor of social reproduction. Um, and that we have to understand the labor of social reproduction, not only in terms of care, but in terms of janitorial work, in terms of cleaning toilets, in terms of, um, you know, uh, all of the other work uh, that is necessary to maintain life, food preparation. There's no contact with, with other human beings. It's not care work. It is uh, what I call the essential work of social reproduction. So I think both of those things, both how we understand care and how we understand the broader category uh, leads me to suggest that we should not exceptionalize care work. Mm -hmm. Indeed. The, the next question, Pramila, uh, so was asking about the limits and possibilities of domestic workers collective action. They ask, they say that the, the domestic work, domestic workers work in individual households, unlike workers, uh, you know, at a factory or an office, what kind of concrete, um, what kind of concrete barriers are there to, to domestic workers collective action, uh, given this reality? And could you talk about, you know, what you found in terms of your historical research on domestic worker organizing uh, in the United States and, and maybe elsewhere? Yeah. Well, the person who asked the question just listed a couple of challenges, right? And that is workers are working in individual homes, right? Our model of labor organizing is on the shop floor where people are on the assembly line next to one another and can talk about their work or in the break room or, um, you know, when they get off work at five o'clock. Uh, and you don't have that in domestic work. You have people who are isolated. You don't know which households are even hiring domestic workers. Um, Domestic work has historically been considered an unorganizable occupation. Um, but in fact, domestic workers have organized and it dates back to 1881 you know, when Tara Hunter, uh, I'm sorry, she wrote a book recently about a strike in 1881 among African-American washerwomen um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so, you know, despite the assumptions that domestic workers are unorganizable, they have organized. Um, and they've done so, you know, as I mentioned, primarily in public spaces um, or through community associations. Domestic work is an occupation uh, that people often uh, get jobs through personal networks, through family members. And so those are also the same networks that are often the basis for organizing. Um, they have been able to um, form associations, and this is throughout history. I write about the 1960s and 70s, but they were organizing in the 1930s. You had a woman named Dora Jones who organized in New York City. Um, and she organized a thousand domestic workers into a, um, a union that then joined the Service Employees International Union. Um, and then the speakers you had previously on the previous panel, I think, are also an example of how you see this massive organizing among domestic workers. There been, or there's been a resurgence of domestic worker organizing since 2000. Um, I'll speak specifically to the question of strikes and domestic worker organizing because I, th well, I'll, I, I want to say two things. One is, I think when you think about worker organizing, one of the questions you have to ask is what kind of leverage do workers have? And I think Monique spoke to this a little bit about worker power. Um, but one of the women I write about, uh, Dorothy Bolden, who organized in Atlanta in the 1960s, um, said that one of the things that domestic workers and perhaps childcare workers more broadly should understand is the power they have in that very emotional connection that's used as a basis of exploitation. 
So employers <laughs> um, are often very tied to a domestic worker. They want to, they want them to be like family, but they also become very dependent on them and see them as family. Whether or not the workers see themselves that way is a whole different issue. But families become very dependent on individual workers. And Bolden said, well, the workers should see that as a point of leverage, as as a way to demand higher wages, as a way to demand, you know, better treatment and working conditions. So I think workers can think about the kind of power they already wield in the in the workplace. Um, and then the other thing is the possibility of strikes. Um, you know, and I think that the pandemic is an absolute indication of the kind of the importance of this work, right? When there are when there's no one to take care of the kids, what do you do, right? And there were people there are people who quit their jobs. You know, that's what the great resignation was about. People said, I can't do this anymore. I can't work and take care of my kids at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's incredibly important work. I think if the pandemic has taught us anything. It's uh, the possibility um, of, of really mobilizing workers uh, who are doing the work of social reproduction in order to strike. And whether or not that strike will be successful is a whole different question. I, I caught the tail end of that conversation earlier. You know, and I don't know if it means that you know, every industry will shut down, but I think what it does mean is that it will uh, raise awareness about the importance of this issue. And secondly, is it will build worker power. I think we have to see this organizing as not an end goal, but as part of a process, a process of moving towards um, a different kind of society. And so every, so we might win some and we might lose some, but it's all part of a, a larger movement. Yes, yeah. Um, Esther, Stephanie, feel free to, to chime in as well. Um, since you both recently led strikes or have organized strikes in the, in the, in the past few years. So, um, Maud. Yes. Um, Stephanie, did you want to go first? <clears throat> okay. Yes. Um, I was just uh, really inspired by your article and by hearing you today, Pramila, talking about the uh, difference between social reproduction and care. And I wondered if you could say something for those of us that want to use those insights um, in our scholarly work, but also in our organizing. You know, if uh, when are the times when um, we should sort of expand that category of care to be more whole encompassing of the non nurturing work. And when is the time to actually maybe get rid of care or to uh, organize around uh, some other uh, category? Um, you know, is that do you see that as an iterative process in terms of, you know, your the specificities of your <laughs> your case and the um, the local uh, cultures of organizing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I I used to use the term care, <laughs> um, but I I have been increasingly troubled by how I have seen the discourse evolve over the past decade or so, um, and the ways in which care has come to mean care for the middle class. The, the way the conversation about care has unfolded, it is care for middle class people. There's, all, there's very little discussion among care scholars. Uh, and though I see those as different from social reproduction scholars, but the way care scholars uh, talk about care, there's less discussion. There is some, but there's less discussion of welfare of systems of public support for the poor of the dismantling of the carceral state and those are systems that directly impact the ways in which poor and working class people are able to care for themselves the language of care um, and care workers 
in some circles is often about rewarding care workers who care for middle class families. We need to expand the immigration system so that we can bring more care workers in from other parts of the world. Or we need to give people legal rights because they're care workers. We need to appreciate the care workers who are taking care of us in moments of crisis. So I've been very troubled by how that how that discourse has unfolded. And I'm actually at a place now where I think we shouldn't use the language of care when we're talking about employment, uh, that we should use some other language. I don't like social reproduction. It's very clumsy. I don't know if you could go to a rally and talk about social reproduction workers. I'm not sure how many people you'll get. Um, uh, Cindy Katz has used the term life's work you know, and that might be a better one. Uh, but I do think we need an alternative to care work uh, because I think it's it's too laden with assumptions about emotion and too centered on uh, a certain category of social reproductive workers. Um, Pramila, we only have a couple minutes left with, with you and with the, the rest of the symposium. Um, I had a question about your, the work that you're doing now, uh, your biography on Marian McCaba. And it, it, it's, I'm linking it back to, to care work and collective action because I think of McCaba as providing the soundtrack for social movements in South Africa and the anti-apartheid movement. Um, what is the role of kind of culture and music and, and, and joy really in, in care work or organizing, domestic work or organizing that, that you've seen? Um, and how maybe does that link to, you know, to your, the work that you're doing now, the research you're doing now on, on McCabe, back to the research you've done on, on the welfare rights movement and, uh, and household workers uniting the domestic workers movement in the United States? Yeah, that's a great question, Simon. So I'll say um, I, I, I want to talk about one of the first domestic worker meetings, domestic workers united meetings I went to in New York City back, I think, in around 2005 or 2006. It was in a church basement in um, in Brooklyn, and there were about 300 people there. They were serving food on one side. There was child care on another side. The meeting was filled with speeches, but also music and dancing. And it's, it's stuck in my mind because it's such a different model of labor organizing than we're used to. The image of the, you know, older white men sitting around a table smoking cigars. Here was a, you know, a labor meeting that was filled with joy, <laughs> as far as I was concerned. Difficult issues, but filled with joy. Um, you know, and Miriam McCaba, I have to say, she uh, was exiled from her uh, country of birth for over 30 years. Um, but she traveled the world. She was a citizen of 13 different countries. Um, she loved to cook. Food is always essential to the way I think about organizing and work. Uh, but she loved to cook and she cooked for people all the time. And I think, you know, that question, the, you know, the, the question of organizing and somebody said earlier about the importance of fighting. Absolutely. We have to fight. We have to be on the picket line. It's not always easy. It's hard. We have to make the difficult choices and hard arguments, but there can also be joy in what we do. And that I think that's the big thing I've taken away from uh, the organizers I've worked with. Thank you, Pramila. And that's a, that's a joyful note to end on. So we appreciate that and appreciate your talk as well. Um, Maude, any concluding comments before we sign off? No, just so a, <clears throat> a heartfelt, Thank you to uh, Pramila and to all of our speakers today, Esther, Stephanie, um, Adriana, and Monique. Yes, thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. Again, Stephanie, Esther, Adriana, Monique, Pramila. Um, thank you, Maude, to all the work that you put in as, as co-organizer in bringing this symposium to life. Uh, thank you to the Sociological Review for the funding as well. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to uh, to put this together. And it, it is going to be recorded and will be uh, probably posted on the Sociological Reviews website um, for other folks to uh, to enjoy and to engage with. And thanks to the audience for for really thoughtful questions and um, you know really engaged questions. So we appreciate it. Okay, everybody, take care. Thanks again for joining us. Round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.